Hey guys. <laughs> Hope you like the little freestyling in the background. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. So day six of George Kelly, and we're caught up. This is actually still kind of like ish going, um, from what I can tell. They're still going. The clock is still running on long crime. So we are going to get started here, chat. My my lovely chiatsus. Um, there are going to be some... Good morning, everybody. Hello. Could you guys hear me just now? Because like, I can't tell if it's not working or not. Because everything says it's on, but I don't think people are reacting. So, Oh, well. Anyway, day six, day six, day six. Sounds good. All right, good. That's weird. Sometimes it doesn't. It. it says, like, all the buttons are red. So, anyways, there will be a jury view. There will be. It started mid-sentence. God damn it. That's why I do this thing and the, the, the time breakdown. So, oh, well. All right. So, we are going to get ready. We're going to do day six. We're going to get started here, guys. Um, there's some beginning stuff. Um, I literally just fired it up. Um, they are going to do a jury view. They are going to haul these people out to the ranch and take a look. And I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to come. Don't come. Don't come. So, all right, guys. So we're going to start up and uh, let's see. Break this down. Lawn decucking long crime. How about that? How about that, chat? It's checking that out. So. Yeah, look at that. It's like fucking professionalism there. All right, so here we go. So if you guys wanted to see what the this side, if you wanted to see what this side of the courtroom looks like, this is the uh, jury box, which I can't believe they're fucking just showing it inadvertently because that means at one point they will fuck that up. Sorry, I'm a little dry. I was talking a lot today. This is this is just an excuse for trouble. They shouldn't be doing it. So let's skip ahead here. That's one issue. Um, All right, here. here we go. Here we go, chats. Yeah, 2023 Yeah, we had some scheduling challenges this morning. One of our witnesses flying in from out of town. Her flight got delayed, so we we're having to change up. The it went okay. So we'll let the court know. Yeah, no big you. deal. I just and I, I knew that I was aware of it, but thank you anyway. I thought we'd use a little time to discuss one issue. Um, since we're going to wait for a witness, are we waiting for that witness? Or do you have another? No, Judge, we have another witness. We're ready to go. Um, oh, okay. We do. We do have a stipulation with respect to that witness that's coming in later this morning, and with respect to the uh, the medical examiner is coming in later as well. Do you want to? Do you have a stipulation for your next first witness? Or? No, that's just cross on Castaneda. We're calling Castaneda to complete the cross examination. Okay. Um, well, then. Uh, we haven't had any storms yet. Yeah, we've been so thankfully. But what we'll talk about, we won't talk about it now. I thought we'd have time, but it's not a big deal. Uh, I want to find out from you where are we on um, your agreed uh, motion for the viewing of the crime scene. So. We're going to bring the jury in now, but... Uh, we're still working on that, Judge. We've kind of got the logistics, I think, agreed upon. The state is still objecting to viewing of the end of the wall. So we would just need a decision from the court on whether the view can include the end of the wall. But other than that, we essentially agreed to put some markers out at different places on the property of things that we would like to view and to have um, a detective... Now, this is a little bit weird. Normally, you do a jury view at the beginning of a trial. You go see everything right at the start. Also, guys, let me know. Can you hear a 2.0? Because I'll close the door if I have to. I'm trying to let the dogs run free a little bit. Um, you can go do that stuff. But um, doing it this late in the trial is a little interesting. But, yes, they are going to go to the ranch. They are going to go take a look at everything. They are going to go. This one's going to be interesting, though, because they're going to put some markers down. And I think this is actually going to help because they're going to have to show the jury where things were, like where George Kelly was, where the body was found, blah, blah, like. <coughs> <coughs> now, remember, though, when you do a jury view, nobody, nobody talks. There is no presentation of evidence. Um, no, they're not going to the bunny ranch. Nobody talks. Nobody tells them anything. 
and they're going to go from there. So that's what's going to happen. So it'll be interesting. One of these days, we're probably not going to be on because they're going to be out doing a multi-hour jury view. So um, very interesting that they're doing it now. Just walk the jury from one to the other. And your honor, we do have some concerns because I believe there's like some kind of memorial where the victim passed away. That would be completely inappropriate for the jury to see. And so I expressed some concerns about that based on photographs I saw from Dr. Martinelli. If that's not what I... Wait, there's a memorial for a dead guy on private property. How the fuck does that work? Although I get it. If he had destroyed it in the meantime, they would have made him look bad. So I guess they're going to go take care of that now. I'm seeing in those photos, if there's not some sort of memorial on the property, then that's not an issue. But I can't tell from the photos. And we would like to go look at it before we agree to it. Or I just want to get some read on where we were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's no memorial. So, I mean, that's going to take a little bit of planning. That's why I'm raising the issue now. Uh, but we have more time to discuss with Erin, perhaps we could do that on Monday? Uh, Monday morning? That's what I was thinking, Judge. That way we could um, have it, we would know before. We want to do it before the close of the state's case. Right. Um, but and we anticipate we may... Because of delays, we're thinking probably next Tuesday or last week. Uh, so. Well, we aren't going to, guys, we're not going to get to, we're not, guys, I'm not getting a tornado. I'm not getting a tornado tonight. It's it's central and western Ohio that's going to get hammered in southern Ohio. We're not going to get anything up here. We'll get like a rainstorm maybe, but it hasn't even broken 50 degrees up here yet. What was that? What's, what's, that was the cable that wasn't going to ground. What? One of the cables on the speaker was caught up. And it wasn't Thank you. I look forward to that. Hopefully they're good. Well, look at that uh, Monday. Would that work for the defense if I could figure that out, set that up for Monday? Monday is not a good day for the defense. We had suggested Tuesday. Um, that was the viewing. Right. She just suggested that she's talking about previewing it. Oh, I was talking about discussing it further in court. But uh, the other thing we have to discuss is that this, this would have to happen at the close of all the evidence. So we need some non-committal uh, estimate of, of what the, um, how long the defense case would take. Surprise report. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of all the jurors, counsel, and the defendants. And we're back on the record uh, in State versus Kelly, and the state can call its next witness. Governor, the state is recalling Officer or Deputy Castaneda to the stand. I believe we were in the defense's cross examination when we took the break for the experts last week. Good morning, Good morning. <clears throat> All right, uh, I'm not sure aware of this, but just for the record, you're still under oath. You're still under oath. Right. Yes, good. All right. Um, the defense can continue with this cross examination. Thank you. So, just to recap, um, we were talking about this last time, but you arrived at the property, Border Patrol was already there, they were doing some preliminary searching. And you and other deputies did some searching of this property, correct? Correct. Do you recall seeing Border Patrol do a perimeter search of the house? Do you remember that? I recall them being there. And you don't know where exactly they were in relation to the house no. when you arrived? No. Okay. 
So when you searched this area, describe for me why you searched the area that you searched. Because the information provided to us was that uh, Mr. Kelly had uh, walked outside his house and, and started following us, the uh, subjects that he had seen carrying, uh, possibly carrying weapons and, and backpacks. And the area that you searched, did you search it because that's where these subjects had supposedly been seen? Repeat that question real quick. Yes, the, the particular area that you searched with the other, it was three other deputies, right? Correct. Was that an area that you searched because that is where Mr. Kelly had been seen or where these subjects had been seen? I don't exactly recall why we started in, in the area with, where we started. Okay. Do you know who, who has that information? Which deputy? No. Okay, but one of you in that group of four had some information that we need to search this general area, right? Yes. And I think the state showed you a picture of a map. I'm going to show you some drone footage. Can we put this up? It's already been admitted. This is State's Exhibit 36. I'm just going to play the footage for you. It goes from the patio on the east side of the house out over the desert area, and then it sort of turns around so you have a view looking back at the house. When it gets to that view, I'm going to pause it, and you can tell me if you can show me on there where you guys all stand out, okay? Spot that looks like something that you can recognize that would be helpful, you can tell me to pause it there. Okay, I'm going to pause right there. Is that a helpful view for you to be able to describe where it was that you guys searched approximately? Yes. Okay. Yes. And you mentioned you went over the first fence on two ladders. Can you show us where those were? Do you know how to mark on there on the screen? Yes. I, I'm not able to see the, the, the matters, but they were somewhere close to this. Uh... Close to the pump house? Yes, close to that. So I see the big house, and then to the right, there's that little small structure, which is the pump house. And then if you go a little bit further to the right, I think you can see the horse right there. Are the ladders more or less in that area where the horse is? Yes. Okay. And can you just, do you know how to draw on the screen? Yes. Could you go ahead and just put a mark on there where the horse is to show where the ladders are? I'll see if I can get rid of this thing on the bottom. I can't. Oh, well. Okay. There we go. So that's where you all crossed over the first fence, right? Correct. And then I think you said you were all sort of together going through to the second fence. Correct. Right? And then can you show me where it is that you fanned out, if you can? I, I wouldn't be able to tell you from here. Does it need to back up a little further? Uh, probably, yes. Let me see if I can move it. Okay. Oh, maybe that's not helpful. Okay. Can you just describe, in relation to the house, the search, my understanding is it's further away from the house than what's on this image. Is that right? Yes. Can you just describe, in relation to the house, at what line approximately you all were searching? So if we drew a line back to the house from where you guys were, what would those lines look like? Could you draw them for us? Do you want me to draw it from how we walked out to, to the fence line? Is that... I want you to draw, if you're already on the other side of the second fence, because that's when you fanned out, correct? Yes. Draw lines going back to the house from where all of you were fanning out. I know you didn't go back to the house, but I think that'll just give us an idea of how spread out you were and where you were in general. Does that make sense? Uh, it does. I'm just not really sure exactly where we started and uh, to go towards the, towards the ladder. I'm talking about after you get over the second fence, and then you spread out. 
I'm just trying to get an idea of how far spread out, what the distribution was like. I'm not really sure how, like, how I would be able to. Like, I don't see those second fence lines here. Hang on. I apologize. Oh, that might have been you. You can hit undo. There we go. So you can see the first fence line in this picture, right? Yes, I believe it's uh, your share market. Yeah, just, just put a point on there so we can see what the first fence line is. First fence line is right here. Okay, and then the second fence line is down at sort of the bottom of this picture, right? Correct. And you guys did not search this area in between the fences, right? Correct. And why not? Why didn't you search that area? Because I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, so you go over the second fence and you all spread out and search from there. Correct. How far apart were each of you when you were searching beyond the second fence? I couldn't tell you. Do you know what order you were in? Was somebody to your right and somebody to your left? Were you at the far end? How do you remember that? No, I was somewhere in the middle. I, I can tell you the exact order. Okay. And then you just continued onward until you hit a wash. Is that right? Yes. And once you hit the wash, do you follow the wash to the right or to the south to hit a road? No, I kept uh, on walking south until I hit a third fence line. Did you south through the wash? I crossed the wash. I went up to the wash and then up the okay. wash. So you continued going east. What you're saying? At the time, I was, that's, I was heading south. Okay, and then you eventually hit a, another fence line somewhere? Yes. Do you know how far away that was from the house? No. Okay, and then you came back to the house, is that correct? Yes. And that was because you had heard that the homeowner had been located? Correct. All right, and so how did you go back to the house? Uh, I walked back um, until I hit a, a third road. And that's where I met uh, Deputy Cabrera and Deputy Montreal. Okay. And just to be clear, when you were searching, you were carrying a rifle, is that right? Yes. That was because of the nature of the call. That was dangerous, right? Yes. And you were looking for people who were potentially armed, is that right? Correct. And you were looking for people who were maybe potentially hiding, right? Correct. And you were looking for people who might potentially be injured, right? Not at the time. Not, no, you weren't looking for people who might be injured? Not at the time. Okay. But you were looking for people who might pose a threat? Correct. Okay. And then when you go back to the house, is the homeowner already there? Just describe to me going back to the house. Um, I walked back to, uh, to the third uh, the third road where I met uh, Deputy Cabrera and Deputy Mugra, and Mr. Kelly was uh, present there. Um, and then I got on to the deputy's unit, and they gave me a ride back to the, to the house. So you met up with Mr. Kelly out on the property somewhere? I, I saw him uh, out of the property, yes. Okay, and then, they, and then you went back to the house, and he went back walking, right? Correct. When you got back to the house, what did you do next to the house? I I talked to Ms. Wanda Kelly. Who else talked to Wanda Kelly when you were there? Uh, Sergeant Garcia. Okay, so both you and Sergeant Garcia were having a conversation with Wanda Kelly, is that right? Yes. And describe Mrs. Kelly's demeanor when she was having a conversation with you. She appeared to be confused uh, to me. Why do you say that? Um, it was just a... Uh, I don't know the way she was answering when, when I would ask uh, a question. Did she seem distraught when you were speaking with her? Could you use a different word for it? Did she seem upset? Not really upset. Did she seem agitated? A little bit. Nervous? Yes. Shaken up, maybe? Yes. Okay. Do you remember how long you spoke to Mrs. Kelly at that time? No. Did you ask her? You didn't ask her to do a walkthrough of the scene or anything like that, correct? I don't recall, no. So you didn't ask her to say, show me where you were standing when you first saw people or anything like that, right? I don't recall asking that. And you didn't ask her, did you, you know, how far away were they? Which direction were they going? Show me precisely where you saw them. You didn't do anything like that with her, right? No. Okay. Do you remember, can we take that down with the lady? I want to make sure nothing pops up on the screen up there. Both you and Deputy Garcia, or Sergeant Garcia, had this conversation with Mrs. Kelly, correct? Yes. And you documented this conversation in your report, correct? Oh, come on. Why are we doing this? Yes. Presumably, Deputy Garcia also documented this conversation in her report, right? I would assume so. And that's standard practice. Whenever you go out, everybody documents these kinds of things in their reports, right? Correct. 
and you and Deputy Garcia are having the same conversation with Mrs. Kelly, right? Yes. And so the reports that you both wrote should contain essentially the same statements. Is that correct? They should. Do you recall Mrs. Kelly telling you that she heard shots? Yes. And would it surprise you to learn, well, did you document that in your report, that Mrs. Kelly stated that she heard shots? Yes. And so Sergeant Garcia also should have documented that in her report, correct? She should have documented what she, what she heard. Would it surprise you to hear that Sergeant Garcia in her report documented that Mrs. Kelly stated she did not hear any shots? Why are we she have, uh, documented what she what she heard? At the time. What the fuck is going on here? God, I hate it when it does this. I wonder if they just ended their stream. They may have just ended, guys. I don't know, but they have the corner up, so that may jam up things as far as we're trying to watch because they're still going. If she documented that Mrs. Kelly stated, "I didn't hear any shots," Sergeant Garcia would be incorrect. Is that right? Again, she would have documented what she heard. And you would have documented what you heard, correct? Correct. And if you documented, Mrs. Kelly said she heard shots. And if Sergeant Garcia documented, Mrs. Kelly said she didn't hear shots. Oh, come on. Shots then one of you is wrong, is that right? Potentially. Unless Mrs. Kelly said both of those things, right? She could have said both things. And if she said both of those things, that would be pretty strange, right? Yes. And that's something that you would probably document in your report, right? I would have. If she said both of those things, right? Correct. But you didn't document that in your report, right? Documented what I recall hearing from her. And what you recall hearing from her is, I heard shots. This is an asking answer, Ms. Mubarak. When you were speaking with Mrs. Kelly, you didn't record this interview, did you? Well, guys, it's also, I don't know what the no. deal is here, but and Sergeant Garcia we'll slow it down a little bit if we have to. You either, correct? Not to my knowledge. And obviously, if there was a recording, then it could be cleared up exactly as to what was said, correct? Correct. Okay, but we don't have that in this case. No. And the same is true for... Mr. Kelly, correct? Correct. So people spoke with Mr. Kelly, but nobody recorded his statements, right? Not on my end. Do you know if anybody recorded his statements? I'm not sure. And after speaking with Mr. and Mrs. Kelly, you get more of the story, is that correct? Yes. So you learn from just from these interviews that, in general, they heard a shot or, or shots, right? Correct. And then they saw some people running with rifles and backpacks, correct? Possibly carrying backpacks and backpacks. Right. And then after you received that information, nobody did any additional searching. Is that right? Correct. Why didn't you do any additional searching? Uh, because at the time Mr. Kelly had been located, our main concern was uh, Mr. Kelly's safety and uh, not finding any subjects. Uh, we assumed that the, the, the threat that we had responded to was, uh, was no longer there. But you were, you were getting information about a pretty serious crime, is that right? Yes. I mean, people carrying backpacks and rifles, that's a serious crime, right? Carrying a rifle is not a crime. If you're on trespassing on someone's property, that's a crime, right? Trespassing, yes. And if you're carrying a rifle while you're trespassing on someone's pro property, that makes it a bit more serious, right? Potentially, yes. And potentially dangerous, right? Yes. And if you're carrying backpacks that are highly suspicious, that's... Possibly indicative of a crime, correct? Not necessarily. Are you in a high drug trafficking area when you respond to Mr. Kelly's property? Um, I uh, undocumented immigrant trafficking area. Drug trafficking also? Uh, in the six years that I've uh, worked for the sheriff's office, I haven't responded to a call in, that involves uh, uh, drug dealing uh, in that area. You did on January 30th, didn't you? Uh, the call was in reference to uh, subjects running with carrying backpacks and rifles. With large backpacks and rifles, right? Correct. You put two and two together, that's possible drug trafficking, right? Objection, argumentative, you want You get this information about these crimes being committed on Mr. Kelly's property, and you get information about a shot being fired, correct? Correct. Shooting is on somebody's property. 
property without their permission is a crime, right? Correct. Shooting at another person is obviously a crime, right? Correct. And that could have been happening out there based on the information you received, right? Potentially, yes. And even after receiving that information, nobody thought to go do a more thorough search of this area, right? Not at the time. Nobody thought to possibly go look for the source of that single shot that Mr. Kelly reported, right? We did went out to search for, for the source uh, when we first arrived while we were looking for the subjects and Mr. Kelly. I'm talking about after Mr. Kelly tells you about that single shot and the subjects that he saw. You didn't go do a more thorough search after that? Not after the first search. And you're aware, obviously, that later in the day, a body was discovered, correct? Yes. And that body was discovered with a single gunshot wound, correct? Yes. And you later learned that that was in that general area that you folks had been searching, correct? In the general area, yes. And so now there's the question of, was this body there when we searched the area, and did we just miss it, right? That's one possibility, right? <coughs> Potentially. Or was this body not there when we searched this area? That's another possibility, right? Potentially. And that's a question that we have that's unanswered, correct? Correct. And that question possibly could have been answered if, after Mr. Kelly gave you information, you folks had gone out there and done a thorough search of that area, right? Yes. Then we would know for sure, right? Yes. But now we don't, right? Yes. I don't have anything else, Sean. Thank you. Redirect. Deputy Castaneda, if Mr. Kelly had told you that he went out onto the patio and fired nine shots east towards people, or even if he told you he fired 50 shots within the air, would you have done a more thorough search? Yes. Council asked you about uh, Ms. Kelly's statements to you uh, while you were out there that day, is that right? Yes. And what specifically did Mrs. Kelly tell you about the shots that she heard? She told me that she heard shots. And what did you, what else did you document when she told you that she heard shots? Do you recall? No. If you looked at your report, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. Mrs. Kelly told you about the shots and what did you document? Uh, that she heard shots and that she appeared to be confused at the time. And what did you say in your report that she appeared to be confused about? Very refresh. Yes, please. Apologies. She said that she was confused about. Uh, I documented it. She appeared to be confused about what she heard. So she's confused about what she heard? Correct. As you're asking her about the gunshots? Correct. And did you, did you ask her if these individuals were carrying backpacks and rifles? Yes. And what did she say? Uh, she said that they were carrying rifles. and. I asked her if uh, all of them were, were carrying rifles. And how did she respond? She said no. She said not all of them were carrying rifles. Correct.
when you spoke to Mrs. Kelly, did she did she tell you who she heard shooting? No. Objection hearsay. Overruled. You've been hearing hearsay from this witness from both sides, so uh, objections overruled. So nothing in your report documents who she heard shooting the weapon. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. That's all I had here. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, jury. Any questions from the jury or this witness? Ah. All right, guys, that was not super. The defense scored some points there, but I, I'm not like no bombshells chat. Not like with the other, not with the other officer. This will be good, though. There's uh, one word you wrote. I can't read. I can't read your writing as to one word. It's Deputy Castaneda something question mark. The question of what? May I before we ask question? Well, what's that word, Deputy? And then Deputy Castaneda. I can read the rest of it, but what's that one word, Deputy Castaneda? It looks like indicated that. Okay, got it. All right, thanks. Now, this is the problem. Some, like, jurors have chicken scratch. I will say, guys, there was one case I was on where the jurors asked questions, and we had to say, we, and the judge is like, I can't read it. We're not answering it. But the judge I was dealing with, he never went back and asked clarifying questions. Like, we all agreed or disagreed whether or not we could answer the question, and we moved on. There was none of this, like, oh, what did you mean, or fucking around, or fluffing pussies, no, fluffing tampons up. Nope, it was like, nope, can't read it, move on. So, the headsets, it is a weird look. It's a weird look. It's a weird, weird look. Um, Duncan Idaho says, should do. Thank you. Oh, we're back. We're back. And all were armed. All right. The question from the jurors, the juror is, uh, Deputy Castaneda indicated that all were armed with rifles or some. So we're going to try to clarify this and answer this question through additional questioning. From All were armed with rifles. It doesn't matter if any one of those guys had a rifle. Reasonable doubt. Bam. Done. Thank you. Parties versus state. I'll give the question to the clerk. Make up. Go ahead. First of all, Deputy, did you talk to Mr. Kelly about... Wait, hold on here. Um, Let me... Did he sustain the question? Let me... Okay, I got to go back and hear this. Indicated that all were armed with rifles or some. So we're going to try to clarify this and answer this question through additional questioning from the parties versus the state. I'll give the question to the clerk. That's interesting. They're not making him answer it. They're just going to clarify more. Hmm. That's interesting. But they've agreed to it, I assume. Make up. Go ahead. First of all, Deputy, did you talk to Mr. Kelly about what he said that he observed that day. Yes. And this, did, what did Mr. Kelly tell you with respect to the subjects, the individuals that he saw, and whether the, or not they were carrying rifles? He advised me, or he, he told me that I, he observed them wearing backpacks and possibly carrying rifles. So his word to you was possibly? Correct. And then did you speak to Mrs. Kelly? Yes. And Mrs. Kelly um, also told you that she thought she observed rifles. Is that right? Correct. And what did she see, say about when when you asked her whether they were all carrying rifles? What was her response? She said no. I think that's all I had, Judge. Thank you. Uh, Larkin? When you asked Mrs. Kelly were they all carrying rifles and she said no, she had previously stated that some of them certainly were carrying rifles, correct? Uh, she didn't mention certainly, she said. But, but 
she said she saw rifles or a rifle, right? Correct. Okay. And just to be clear, neither of these conversations were recorded by anybody as far as we know, right? Correct. I don't have anything else. All right. Any other questions for this witness from the jurors? Sir, uh, did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Very Thank good. You. All right. Thank you. Uh, officer, sorry. Uh, good stuff down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And this we discuss the schedule. All right. I mean, based on that, I think we kind of got issues about doubt. A little bit. All right, who's this guy going to be? He's not the yeah, medical examiner. I guess it's morning, isn't it? I don't even know what day it is. Sorry about that. Could you tell the jury, please, your full name and your occupation? My name is Rafael Lopez. Uh, I'm currently a deputy sheriff at the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been a police officer? Uh, Ten years. And have you spent all that time with the Sheriff's Department? I started in... 
fifteen twenty seven, fifteen twenty eight hours. So close to three thirty in the afternoon. Yes. When you got there, what's the first thing you observed when you arrived? I saw the patrol cars uh, in the area, and uh, I went straight to one of them. Um, somebody, I think I heard over the radio that uh, they were looking for Mr. George Kell, or a subject uh, with uh, two dogs and a rifle. So I went um, and approached one of the of the units, the patrol cars, uh, and that was uh, Sergeant Lilia Garcia. And after you saw, uh, after you spoke with Sergeant Garcia, what did you observe next? Well, when I was um, talking to her car to car, um, she mentioned that she could hear dogs, and and she pointed to to the distance, and and then we saw that. Uh, there was a uh, uh, two border patrols coming uh, on with a male subject, and he, and she said it was it was it was probably him. So you saw two border patrol officers, and what were they doing? Were they walking? Were they in a vehicle? What, what they were walking with with Mr. Kelly. And you later identified him as Mr. Kelly. They did um, um, because he started. He, he was walking towards the uh, patrol cars, and they, and they said it was him. So I just remained there for a few minutes, and then I knew it was him because that was the reason I was there to kind of go search for him. Um, and uh, they said it was him. And, and what did you see of him when you were there? <clears throat> he was carrying a rifle and. Dogs were with him. Can you see him here in the courtroom today? Yes. Yeah. Could you describe what he's wearing for the courtroom? Uh, he's wearing his uh, blue shirt and uh, blue vest. And could the record reflect the witnesses identified? And after you knew that Mr. Kelly had been located, and that was why you were there, was to help locate him, what did you do next? Um, I just uh, went back. Uh, I, I left the scene. Uh, I think they remained there still uh, while I left. So you were there pretty briefly, it sounds like? Yeah, probably 10 minutes or less. Did you have some involvement in this case later in the day? Yes, I did. And can you tell us um, what started that involvement later in the day? Well, I was actually working uh, Operation Stone Garden. And could you explain what that is to the jury, please? It's a different assignment that. We work uh, ourselves at, uh, after that we're done with our patrol duties. Uh, we sign off for that. That's it's, it's usually overtime. It is overtime. So uh, what happens there is that this operation, uh, it's uh, working uh, alongside or or in conjunction with a uh, border patrol uh, to assist with uh, any illegal narcotics or or immigrants coming in through the border. Uh, what happened that day, I came in at uh, uh, to work on uh, Stone Garden at uh, 4 p.m. That's why I left the scene that day, so I could be on time to start the other assignment. Um, I started at 4 p.m., and then uh, it runs from 4 to 8 p.m. But uh, while I was um, working in Stone Garden, um, I was assigned to Duquesne uh, Road, which is uh, nearby where the incident had occurred earlier with Mr. Kelly. Um, so I took it upon myself to go check the the side uh, 
dirt roads that lead to the to the border. Um, and I was just in case I saw because they had mentioned there were uh, subjects running uh, earlier, and I said, you know what, I'll check just in case there's somebody hiding or it's already past three hours or two hours since, since this occurred. They could now think that we're not here. We'll probably, if there's somebody walking in the area, I'll probably see them. So I went to a, a forest service road, which is a side uh, dirt road that leads to the, to, the, to the border. And I was there when I heard another another call from dispatch. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what you're telling me. You you check out of the call at the Kelly residence and you check on to Stone Garden, but you decide you're gonna go ahead and search the area because you're concerned. Because uh, they assigned me to that area, Duquesne. Okay. Duquesne, which is a, the road that passes through uh, King Springs Village uh, in Duquesne. It, okay. it leads to the, to the uh, um, that area, the, near the ranch. And so you said you drove down a Forest Service road. And did I understand you to say the Forest Service road that goes to the border? Yeah, those Forest Service roads, uh, technically, they're, they're roads that, that interconnect and they lead to the border. Okay. If you follow them all the way, they lead to the, to the, to the border wall or the fence. Did you see anything while you were looking in this area? No, I was looking, uh, and I didn't see anything, anybody in the end. And then I think you documented in your report that you were at Duquesne in a Forest Service road. Which Forest Service road was that? Uh, 4667. <clears throat> okay, and when you were at that Forest Service road in Duquesne, what's the next thing that happened? I heard over the radio that uh, uh, dispatch uh, was saying that uh, Border Patrol had called, uh, saying that uh, uh, to proceed again to the same area where we had gone before, which was uh, Mr. Kelly's uh, place, uh, and mentioned that he had struck something. And what time did this call come out? Around 1756. And what time is that in non-military time? Uh, like 556 p.m. And when you got this call, what did you do? Um, even though I was nearby, uh, I decided to go and assist the, the cause this call was uh, given to the patrol uh, officers, whoever was in charge of uh, that uh, district, uh, but I decided to go myself as, as well, just to make sure everything was fine. I actually arrived before the, the patrol officer that was supposed to head over there. I, I arrived before. Okay, so there, a, a patrol officer got deployed as well, and you, because you're in the area, I went ahead and responded. Because, yeah, it was, it was the, the call was given to a patrol officer. All right. Um, the sign one. And uh, since it's too far from Rio Rico for them to make it all the way to the ranch, and I was nearby, I uh, proceeded myself as well. Was there something about the call that led you to be concerned before you arrived? Well, yes, because uh, earlier we we had heard that there were shots fired and we didn't know if it was going to, something was going on again. So that's why I decided to go over and assist. Just when, when you got there, um, at some point, you were concerned enough that you did something. What did you do when you arrived? Well, actually, I uh, when I arrived to the gate, I saw Mr. Kelly coming towards the gate. He was on the phone, and uh, I decided to turn on my uh, my recorder, my issued recorder from the sheriff's office. What caused you to do that? Well, the reason was that we knew that that uh, earlier the reports 
where that uh, shots were fired. So I needed the information just to get it correct. And did you document this recording? Uh, did you put that on, into evidence? I did. And when you put that into evidence, what, what item number did you mark it with? Uh, item number one, RL. That's pretty much where I'm at, guys. Not guilty. <clears throat> Showing you what's been marked is State's Exhibit 38. Do you recognize that item? Yes. How do you recognize it? Because it's a copy of the CD that I... Uh, for uh, for the recording that I uh, got that day. And how do you know that it's a copy of that recording? It says here. Look, this recording of Kelly. Did you review that recording and initial and date it on the back of that envelope? That was on uh, July twenty fifth of of. 23, which was last year, when I uh, went and reviewed it and initialed it. And is that an accurate, accurate copy of the recording of the recording you made of Mr. Kelly on January 30th of 2023? Yes. Can I move for admission of State's Exhibit 38? No. Exhibit 38 is admitted. Can I have permission to publish? Granted, do we need to dim the lights or? Your Honor, we, it's just an audio recording, oh. but I do have a stack of transcripts to hand out for everyone that I've provided to the JAA with the court's permission. Um, just for the record, I'd object on the best evidence rule. I, I think that just hearing the recording is better than the transcript. And Your Honor, I can lay the foundation for the transcript as well because the deputies observe so is, that it, is the audio difficult to hear? It can be judged. Um, it's just for everyone's convenience and following along. There are some of it is kind of faded in and out, so you really have to listen. And it's all audio; it's not video. All right, you can uh, you can go ahead and distribute those to the jurors. But so, members of the jury, you're going to get a, a transcript of whatever it is you're going to hear. The evidence is the recording itself. The transcript is not evidence. The transcript is just there to. Uh, it's not being admitted, so it's not going into evidence. The transcript is there to aid you if you want to try to understand what's being said on the recording. But if you hear something different on the recording from what's in the transcript, the recording is the evidence, not the transcript. It's kind of like, like another one of those um, what I call demonstrative exhibits. And, Listen carefully because uh, when you go back into the jury room to deliberate the case, the evidence will be recording and you won't have the transcript. So the objection is overruled. It has a valid objection. Also, review the transcript. Um, that we're going to look at with this recording as well. Yes. And was it accurate? Uh, yes. Uh, I did do a, a correction on, on, which is on page three, the uh, fourth line. Um, on my report, it said he, uh, if he shot it, and uh, on the Recording and says who shot it. I asked him who, sh if but you who, said who shot it. That I made the, that that uh, correction. Okay. He for who? It should be he shot him. Not no, who shot him? It should say who shot him. Yeah, it's on page three. Okay. 
So the correction's been made on the transcript. The correction was actually to his report, is what I understand. Is that yeah, right? to the supplemental report. Yeah, it's it's uh, later was discovered on, and uh, that word was changed to who shot. Him. Okay, so the transcript's actually accurate. Yes, uh, I also made the correction on the first line of the of the supplemental report. The the case number was listed as 21-130-006 instead of, on the report, instead of 23-0130-006. Okay. That was fixed, and then... Uh, but that's not the transcript, right? That's your, an error, both are errors in your report. Yeah, no, the transcript, the only error was that, the, the he for a who. Okay. Which the who is a correct one. And could we have the... Guys, this is going to be good. Here we go. Wait, where did it go? What, what, what? I thought we were going to do the video. So we're in the recording. What the fuck? Great. There we go. Guys, I've got it sound boosted all the way up. I can't. Guys, I've got the sound boosted up and I can't hear shit. So I apologize. You just have to read it. You got no idea. You know what I'm saying? 
We'll get to that question, Woozy. Nothing to me being chubby. It's just I'm going. No, there's no better source. That's courtroom audio. Ten feet from my patrol car. 
And what happened when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived? I was already off my vehicle, and Mr. Kelly was also with me. And he, he when we saw the when he saw the patrol car arriving, he asked who it was, and I told him it was one of the sheriffs. And what did Sergeant Rodriguez do when he when he got there? He came straight to us. And when he got there, what did he um, ask Mr. Kelly to do? Uh, I don't remember what he asked, but Mr. Kelly did mention that. There was a, a flashlight that he left where the body was at. Okay. And so at this point, Mr. Kelly's telling you he left a flashlight near the body? He told the uh, um, Sergeant Rodriguez. Okay. And after he told Sergeant Rodriguez that, what did Sergeant Rodriguez do next? Um, well, Mr. Kelly uh, was talking to him and uh, I was behind him, and then uh, he told him about the flashlight, and Mr. Mr. Kelly told him about the flashlight, so he, so he, which and pointed over there. He then, uh, Sergeant Rodriguez um, asked him if uh, he was armed. And what did Mr. Kelly say? He said he was. And what happened after that? Uh, Sergeant Rodriguez told him that it, um, if it was okay, if he could leave his gun now. Um, here, instead of uh, carrying it over there, Mr. Kelly, uh, um, if he was uh, good uh, to leave it, and then Mr. Kelly said yes. And what did Mr. Kelly do at that point? Um, he took his gun from uh, his waist, and I don't remember if I got it myself or he put it himself in, in the trailer because the trailer was like maybe 10 feet from us, 12 feet. What kind of trailer? So a small horse trailer. But in any event, somehow Mr. Kelly's uh, weapon that he had on his waist was left in the trailer. Yeah, the door was, um, it was on the, on the back door, inside. In the back door, on the inside of the trailer. Uh-huh. And then what did y'all do next? Um, we proceeded to follow him uh, or go with him. Um, Towards, the, towards the, the other gate that's next, that's right next to it, we we then um, walked towards the, the area where the flashlight was at, and uh, do you know what time this was? No, it was very quick. Uh, when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived, uh, it was probably four minutes later. Okay, and and so you head toward the area where the flashlight's hanging in the tree. Is that right? Yes. And where was that on this map, generally, if you know? Yeah, generally it was uh, probably somewhere in this area. Okay. Um, and so, how did you get there? Uh, walking. Do you do you did you mark this area at all, or are you just guessing? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, you circled an area on the map. Did you document that in any way with GPS or with anything? Not me. Not me. <clears throat> Somebody else did that. Somebody else did that. So the circle you just made. It's it's. Technically, it's technically east of the house, of the ranch house, um, south, southeast. So that area, that circle you just drew is not southeast. Guys, I'm going to try to refresh to see if we can get through this, because this is just, this is obnoxious. Uh, it's a Southern Air uh, Law Enforcement Training Center. And how long stood the academy? Uh, I stayed there for, since... September 2011 till January. On January 30th of 2023. Yes. Turner moved for admission of State's Exhibit 38. No. Exhibit 38 is admitted. Turner permission to publish. He would meet with me over there, so he could take us or take me to the to the site where the body was was located. <coughs> And so you waited for him there by the trailer? Actually, it was only like a minute. Okay. Um, he was already coming back. Ah! And I was looking at him. He was coming. As soon as he arrived, um, there was another patrol car coming. And do you know what time that was that the other patrol car arrived? Was Guys, I, don't, I can't stop it from buffering. There's nothing uh -huh. else to do. 6.15 p.m. and p.m. 6.17, 6.16. And 
And who was in that other patrol car? It was um, Sergeant um, Omar Rodriguez. And did he pull his patrol car near where you were? Yes, he parked uh, approximately 10 feet. from my patrol car. And what happened when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived? I was already off my vehicle and Mr. Kelly was also with me and he, he, he when we saw the when he saw the, the patrol car arriving he asked who it was. And I told him it was one of the sheriffs. And, and what did Sergeant Rodriguez do when he when he got there? He came straight to us. And when he got there, what did he um, ask Mr. Kelly to do? Uh, I don't remember what he asked, but Mr. Kelly did mention that there was a, a flashlight that he left where the body was at. Okay. And so at this point, Mr. Kelly's telling you he left a flashlight near the body? He told the uh, um, Sergeant Rodriguez. Okay. And after he told Sergeant Rodriguez that, what did Sergeant Rodriguez do next? Um, Turn down the video quality, but I think it's just because it's still not, they're still airing it. But well, whatever. Mr. Kelly uh, was talking to him and uh, I was behind him. And then uh, he told him about the flashlight and Mr. Mr. Kelly told him about the flashlight. So he, so he which and pointed over there. He then, uh, Sergeant Rodriguez um, asked him if uh, he was armed. And what did Mr. Kelly say? He said he was. And what happened after that? Uh, Sergeant Rodriguez told him that it, um, if it was okay, if he could leave his gun uh, um, here instead of uh, carrying it over there. Mr. Kelly, uh, uh, if he was uh, good uh, to leave it, and then Mr. Kelly said yes. And what did Mr. Kelly do at that point? Um, he took his gun from uh, his waist, and I don't remember if I got it myself or he put it himself in, in the trailer because the trailer was like maybe 10 feet from us, 12 feet. What kind of trailer? It's a small horse trailer. But in any event, somehow Mr. Kelly's uh, weapon that he had on his waist was left in the trailer. Yeah, the door was, um, it was on the, on the back door inside. In the back door on the inside of the trailer. Uh -huh. And then what did y'all do next? Um, we proceeded to follow him uh, or go with him um, towards, the, towards the, <laughs> the other gate that's next that's right next to it. We we then um, walk towards the the area where the, the flashlight was at, and. Uh, Do you know what time this was? No, it was very quick. Uh, when Sergeant Rodriguez arrived, uh, it was probably four minutes later. Okay, and and so you head toward the area where the flashlight's hanging in the tree. Is that right? Yes. And where was that on this map, generally, if you know? Yeah, generally it was uh, probably somewhere in this area. Okay. Um, and so how did you get there? Uh, walking. Do you, do you, did you mark this area at all, or are you just guessing? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, you circled an area on the map. Did you document that in any way with GPS or with any Not me, not me. <clears throat> Somebody else did that. Somebody else did that. 
So the circle you just made? It's it's technically, it's technically east of the house, of the ranch house, um, south southeast. So that area, that circle you just drew, is not southeast of the ranch house. Is that right? It's to the east of the house where the body was bent. I don't didn't get the coordinates or anything, but I know we walked uh, to that side. Okay. And how did you get there when you walked? Was there, were you just hiking through the grass or was there a path? Or how did you get there? Uh, there was uh, grass and the, I believe there was a little path, but it was not too, not too uh, marked. Uh, I don't really remember, but um, it was like a three minute walk, two, three minute walk. So you walked for two or three minutes, and what did you find after you walked for two or three minutes? When we got there, um, I could see a body, and I just stopped right there before we all stopped. Uh, then Sergeant Rodriguez uh, approached the body and uh, started examining to make sure it was was or check if, if the person was still alive. Did Sergeant Garcia have some conversation with Mr. Kelly at this point? It was Sergeant Rodriguez, not I'm Garcia. Sorry. Did Sergeant Rodriguez have some conversation with Mr. Kelly at this point? Yeah, they did they have a small talk and uh, and he went straight to the to the body. Did you document the conversation between Sergeant Rodriguez and Mr. Kelly? No, he, he probably documented it himself. Do you recall the conversation at all? No, I just uh, remained uh, there because uh, the two dogs were also nearby. Uh, I concentrated on not disturbing or leaving any, because I know there was going to be some footprints or something. So I just stood there with Mr. Kelly and, and we he stayed with me as well. And. Uh, well, Sergeant Rodriguez examined the body. And then what's the next thing that happened? Well, uh, I was able to see from, from, from where I was standing, probably more than 10 feet, the, there was a, a person lying face down and he had a stain of blood on his right side. I, I could see that there was a black radio to next to him and then a little uh, Fanny pack on the side as well. The a radio. Yep. Tactical boots. I don't remember what he was wearing, but um, mm, soon after, uh, Sergeant Rodriguez said the person was deceased. I'm going to show you. Next, what's been marked as State Exhibit 35, um, image number 0038. That's already been admitted. <clears throat> Is this what you observed when you were there that day? Yes. And you talked about a tree with a flashlight in it. Is that the tree in the background you're referring to? The flashlight? Well, yeah, it should be a tree next about 10 feet from, from where it was. From where the body is. Does that appear to be accurate? Very accurate. And I see some lights in the background. Is that the Kelly residence in the background? I think, I think so. Do you know? Yeah, the tree, because the tree was to this side and it was pointing to the house was to that side as well. So is that, does that appear to be accurate? Yes, it, it would be the house, the ranch. So after you're there and Mr. Kelly and, Mr. and Sergeant Rodriguez have a conversation, um, what's the next thing that you do? Sergeant Rodriguez uh, told me that uh, we should go back and, uh, and, and take the, the dogs to the, to the residence. And what was the reason for taking the dogs, do you know? Because they were running around and the, he didn't want the scene disturbed. And so did you do that? Yes, me and Mr. Tom, we, we went back and did the dogs. And when you got back, um, what's the next thing that happened? 
well from there we walked all the way to the, his house the same route we took when we left the patrol cars we passed through the through the trailer kept going walked all the way to the house uh to the garage area and uh he left his two dogs uh inside after he did that where did you and mr kelly know at that point we then went back and walked to the patrol cars and stayed uh, outside near the patrol cars. And what's the next thing that happened? Um, I told them that we were going to wait uh, for um, more uh, assistance from uh, uh, deputies to come in, and, and then we remained there for probably more than 40 minutes. And at one point, did Sergeant Rodriguez ask you to do something? Yeah, uh, I believe we were there um, when Sergeant Rodriguez told me to remove the the gun from the trailer and secure it in my patrol car. And did you do that? Yes, I did. And what? Who who arrived next to the scene? I know more deputies arrived. Uh, we were there. I believe it was. Um, I'm not sure if it was a uh, deputy. And that's okay. It doesn't matter who was the next person to arrive. But at some point, did Sergeant Garcia arrive at the scene? Yes, they all they started arriving at. But since I was over with Mr. Kelly, they never met with me or anything. That's I mean, I know that they started coming in uh, more patrol cars. Did you see what Sergeant Garcia did at that point when she arrived? No. At some point, did Sergeant Pacheco arrive? Yes, he, he did arrive. And what did Sergeant Pacheco um, say when he arrived? He later um, went to where I was at and uh, met with Mr. Kelly. And what did he do with Mr. Kelly? He told him uh, he needed to get a statement from him and uh, told him he was going to head down to the, well, uh, told him that he needed to go with him because he needed a statement from him. And before he did that, did he search him? He, uh, he retrieved uh, his, um, cell phone, uh, magazine with ammo, and a uh, folding knife with, in a pouch. And what did he do with those items? He gave them to me. And after he retrieved those items, did he place Mr. Kelly in handcuffs? Mr. Handcuffs, Mr. Kelly was, was placed in handcuffs. Was there some issue about putting gloves on Mr. Kelly because it was cold as well, if you recall? I don't recall. I don't and so after he handed those personal items over to you, what did he do next? What did he do? He left with Mr. Kelly from where we were standing. And uh, from there, I just remained at my patrol car and uh, secured the items inside my patrol car as well. And then um, Sergeant Julia Garcia came up to me shortly after and uh, provided me with a, a crime scene log but she already started and told me to uh, stay there. I moved myself to where the other patrol cars were at, the, the ones that followed. And uh, from there, I uh, just remained there logging in whoever came or whoever left and while I was in charge of the crime team. At some point, later, that evening, did the detectives arrive? Yes. And there were detectives there earlier as well, correct? Yes, uh, Sergeant uh, Alfonso Flores arrived. And did Sergeant Flores go out to where the body was located with Sergeant Rodriguez, if you know? I never saw him with me, so he was probably over there. Okay, he wasn't with you, so you don't know where he was? I don't know where he was. Okay. Now, later that evening, did detectives arrive with a search warrant? Yes. What time was that? I don't recall the time, but uh, they uh, began searching inside the, inside the residence. Was that um, before or after midnight, if you know? Uh, I don't recall. Okay. Probably after midnight. And when, at some point, the items that you had in your patrol car, did you turn those over to someone else? Yes, at the end, uh, 
when they uh, were in, in the residence, uh, they told us that we could leave sometime like 1 a.m. So before leaving at that time, I passed those information to, to uh, Detective uh, Mario Barba. I told him I have those items and I gave it to him uh, at, at that time. So just so we're clear, you said that you had um, Mr. Kelly's handgun from the trailer, is that right? Yes, and then the three other items. And do you know, was that a forty caliber handgun? Do you know? I wouldn't even know. So you just turned over whatever it was that you took from the trailer to Mario Barba? Yeah, from the trailer and then the, the three items. And then the three items you turned over were the cell phone, the magazine with the ammo, and the pouch with the folding knife. Did you do anything else at the scene? Or was that the end of your involvement? That was the end of the involvement. I mean, technically, I just stayed with Mr. Kelly all that time until Sergeant Pacheco arrived and, and took with him. I could speak with him as well. Okay, that's all I have, Norman. Thank you. All right, thank you. It's a good time to break for our mid morning break. Uh, we'll take a 30 minute break, so. Um, I mean, what are you guys thinking? I'm not feeling the. This is not riveting testimony that he did it. This is this is definitely not inspiring me to convict the guy. So we're gonna do a little bit of time traveling here. We're gonna go whoop 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 whoa 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 whoa. He said 30 minutes, and that wasn't 30 minutes, man. Um, okay, so I just want to go back to, you responded to the first call that happened in this case earlier in the day. Is that right? Just let's, let's rewind it here. Here, make sure we didn't miss it. Yep, there he goes. All right, here we go. Now it's louder, too, which is nice. They fix the sound. That was running so quiet earlier. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I just want to go back to, you responded to the first call that happened in this case earlier in the day, is that right? Yes. But that was just very briefly, you sort of touched base with Sergeant Garcia and then you were done, is that right? Yeah, I remained there a few minutes, so. Okay, but you'd seen the property and you knew where it was from going on that first call, right? Yes. And then later in the evening, you are doing Operation Stone Garden near Duquesne Road, correct? Yes. I think you said that you were on a Forest Service road that connects with Duquesne Road, is that right? Yes. That Forest Service Road, is that to the east, generally, of Mr. Kelly's property? Um, southeast, probably. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's on, the, south, on the east side. So Duquesne Road generally sort of goes west to east, right? East-west? Duquesne Road? It's on the east side of his, his residence. The Forest Service Road, right? Duquesne Road. And then uh, Duquesne Road has several dirt roads that, or Forest Service roads that start from it. And those kind of connect up with each other and eventually go to the end of the wall. Is that right? Some of them, the one where I was at, it's, it's one of those that leads to that area. Okay. That's not on Mr. Kelly's property, correct? Uh, no. That's some distance away from his property, correct? It's a forest service road, so. Do you know how far away it is from Mr. Kelly's property? No, you can't see the, I mean, I wasn't able to see the, look for the house from there. I was just on that road. Okay. And it took you some time when you got the call to drive out to Mr. Kelly's property, right? Yes. About how much time, do you remember? Probably a little bit more than 10 minutes. And so the Forest Service Road is about a 10 minute drive away from Mr. Kelly's property, more or less? Yes, because like I said, it leads to the border, so I was like, not a, I was farther in on that road. Okay, so you go back to Duquesne Road and then over. I gotcha. And when you get to Mr. Kelly's property, you turn on your recording, is that right? Yes. Why did you turn on the recording that you had with you? Um, to get the facts, the initial facts. What kind of a device is that? Is that something you carry with you or something you leave in your car? It's, it's a small, uh, it should be recorded, um, probably an inch. You, it's not a body cam, correct? No, it's not. It's not something that you wear on you when you answer calls, no. right? You carry it with you in your car? Yes. And you bring it out if you ever think, I need to record something. Is that right? Yes. Do other deputies have the same recording devices in their cars? Do you know? I don't know. Okay. But yours was issued to you from the Sheriff's Department? Yes. Okay. So you take this recording out and you begin to record when you arrive at Mr. Kelly's property, right? Yes. 
And that's the recording that we heard, and that's the transcript that you have in front of you, correct? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And you mentioned making a correction to your police report, right? Yes. And I want to just kind of drill down on that a little bit. So you document in your police report what you believe Mr. Kelly said to you. Is that correct? I document what I heard of a recording. Okay. So when you write this police report, this is January 30th. Do you remember when you wrote your police report? I wrote it uh, probably the following day, maybe two days later. And when you were writing that report, did you listen to the recording or were you writing this from memory? No, I listened to the recording to, in order to, to put in the, what he said. Okay. And in your report, uh, do you have it in front of you by any chance? No. If you don't, I can show it to you. But in your report, it says, I asked him, meaning uh, Mr. Kelly, I asked him if he shot him, and he said he had no idea. Does that sound like what you documented in your report that you later had to correct? Yes. Okay. So how did you become alerted to the fact that this was wrong? What you wrote down in your report was wrong, and you needed to correct it. Because um, I had a transcript, which is the one that I have here in front, um, that I, had, I reviewed um, later on. Uh, at the penitentiary, just to make sure that everything was correct. That's where I, I saw the discrepancy. And that's a pretty significant discrepancy, correct? Yes. Because originally you wrote down that Mr. Kelly stated, in response to your question, did you shoot this person? He stated, I don't know, essentially. That's initially how you documented that in your report, right? He said he didn't know. That's what you documented in your report initially, correct? I don't have the report with me, so I need to see if it's... Can you pull up on his screen so he can take a look at your report? Uh-oh, we're starting to see some problems now. And it's in the second paragraph there. Oh, yeah, I see it. You see it? And so it says, I asked him if he shot him, and he said again he had no idea, right? Uh-huh, he said... And so that the implication there is that you asked Mr. Kelly directly, did you shoot this person? And he said, I don't know, right? That's that's the implication of what you documented in your report, right? Report. And that was not correct, right? No, it was um, who shot him. And that, that completely changes the meaning, right? Yes. You asked Mr. Kelly who shot him, and he said, I have no idea. That's very, very different, right? Yes. And so you obviously needed to make that correction because that was a significant error, right? Yes. That's a big freaking error. And it's a thing that you have this recording, right? Yes. Because then you could look back and go, oh, wow, I wrote down the wrong words in my report. I need to change this, Oh, right? yes. God. And that only happened when you reviewed the transcript, correct? That's when you caught that error? <sighs> That's yes, scary, when, guys. Um, That's scary, chat. It's like word by word. You stopped recording Mr. Kelly at some point, correct? Yes. Why did you stop recording him? Uh, he went to pick up his jacket, and I stopped uh, the recording uh, when he left the house. And why did you stop the recording? Because he was not with me at that time. He left to his house. But then he came back and joined you and showed you where the body was, right? Yeah, he came to be with, with me at the near the trailer. And just to be clear, when he first encountered you and you came up to the house, he said that there was a dead body and it was a person, correct? He said it was a uh, dead, uh, fresh body. And if you just you have the transcript in front of you? Yeah. And it's on page one. And I'm looking it gets at worse, I get it. Think about that. Think about that, guys. You know, George Kelly's trying to help out the police, man. He tells him something, and the cop writes down something completely different. You know, if you have to speak to the police, if you're going to, like, don't do it. But make sure that's recorded. Because all it takes for him to say, nope, it's in my report. What's in my report is correct. And then what? You're screwed. That recording saved George Kelly's ass right now. Line number 21. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. It's, 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 it's a person. So that's the first time he's encountered law enforcement on his property since he discovered this body, right? That's you, right? You're the first person he encounters, right? After discovering the body? Yes. Yeah, he said he called the border patrol and then they right. called us and I got there first. You got there first. And he tells you there's a dead body, there's a person here, right? Yes. Okay. And so 
after he goes to the house to get his jacket and he takes you out to go see the body, why don't you start recording again at that point? My recorder, I put it in the console, and uh, when uh, Officer Rodriguez was 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 um, arriving to the gate, I stepped down the vehicle and left it in in, in, in the console, center console. Was it out of battery or something? Or did you no, I inadvertently left it there because I had put it in there when I was uh, okay. um, when I stopped recording. Okay, and. Uh, Rodriguez, he wasn't recording either, as far as you know, correct? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. And any conversations then that you have with Mr. Kelly at, when Rodriguez is there are, to your knowledge, not recorded, right? From my part, they're not. Okay. When you, you went out to go see where the body was with Rodriguez and Mr. Kelly, is that right? Yes, we, the three of us went over there. I think you said that Rodriguez examined the body. Mm -hmm. What yeah. did he do to examine the body? Can you explain that? He kneeled down and he had his back on, on to us, but he, I, I know he was checking for, for a pulse on the body. You know he was checking for a pulse? Well, like I said, I mean, he, he minutes later he said the body was, was deceased. Okay. So he was checking to see if it was alive. Do you remember if he put gloves on before he did that? No, I wouldn't. That was kind of maybe a 10 feet, a little 12, 13 feet. So you don't remember and you didn't see that? Like I said, I stayed, I stayed far from the body so as to not disturb it. Then he walked to it and uh, now uh, down and, and uh, started checking on, on, on the body. Did you see him lift up any part of the body or touch the body in any way? I didn't. I don't recall. I don't, I don't know. I don't know okay. if he lifted the body or not. But he did say minutes later, a few seconds later, that it was not a lie. And you don't recall if he touched the fanny pack or the backpack or anything like that either, no. right? Okay. You go back, so Rodriguez tells you essentially to go back with Mr. Kelly, right? And to go wait somewhere away from the body? No, he tells tells me to go with him so the, the dogs can be uh, secured. Okay. The dogs and you and Mr. Kelly then leave the area. Do you know if anybody, whether Rodriguez or or you, did anybody look for tracks around this body? When I left with the dogs, I didn't come back to the scene. Okay. I, so I'm, I'm not sure who, who looked for tracks or if Sergeant Rodriguez did or I don't know who. But you didn't look for any tracks? Not me. Okay. What were the dogs doing around this body? Could you observe their behavior? I do remember when we were walking, towards the body the first time to see where it was, one of the dogs like went to the area when we were walking and kind of sniffed around the, uh, that's what I remember. Uh, the dogs were like not sitting uh, next to us or anything. Uh, they were they were there, but um, that's the only thing I can recall when, when we were heading there, that one of the dogs was in the area, kind of stopping and sniffing, but we were still uh, walking to the to the body. That's what I remember. Okay. And then you wanted to move the dogs away from the body so that they wouldn't contaminate the crime scene. Is that right? Yes, I didn't. They just told me to move it. Oh. Uh, to, that we take into the house. I gotcha. And then you said that you're with Mr. Kelly, and at some point, I think you said it was Pacheco comes and puts him in handcuffs and says, we need to get a statement from you. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Sergeant Pacheco ran later on and told him he needed a statement from him and then put him in handcuffs and took him yes. in. Nobody attempted to get a statement from Mr. Kelly on the scene, is that right? No, uh, when no, when I walked, we just walked to his house. And... Do you have any idea why nobody asked him any questions on the scene about what happened? Well, from my part, uh, when we when we saw the body and it was deceased, I mean, we know that we're gonna need a statement from him, uh, but it's gotta be a formal one, so. So no questions were asked and nobody, from my side. Nobody asked him to demonstrate on his property, this is what I saw, this is where I was, this is what I did. Nobody asked him to do that, correct? Not from my part. Okay, so they just took him in and took him without asking him anything on the scene. I want you to describe this area for me just a little bit, because um, you were there earlier in the day and then you came for the second call as well. Can you see the border wall from this property? I don't recall. I know when I got there the first time, I went around 
and towards uh, the, the south side, southwest side, and uh, where the where the vehicle for Sergeant Garcia was at. She was on the on the, on the road, on dirt road, so that's when I met with her. But I don't, I really don't recall viewing the wall. You can probably see it from there, but uh, from my part that day, I didn't look for the wall. And again, I just went over there to see if we could find Mr. Kelly because okay. of the concern that. It would be pretty far off in the distance then. Is that fair to say? Yes. So if a witness described the border wall as being just two football fields away from this property, that would not be accurate. Is that right? Like I said, I, mean, I don't know how far the wall is from there. It's, 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 it's not near. It's, if it were two football fields away, you would have seen it, right? I would have seen it. And if a witness, you saw where the body was in relation to this house, is that right? Yes. If a witness said that this body was 10 yards away from the house, that would be incorrect, right? It was to the east and uh, probably more than 200 feet. So 10 yards is definitely not Because it's not a fence. It's not like a uh, horse fence. Um, and then, my question is just 10 yards is no, definitely not, not correct, yards. right? When you were on the way, when you were responding to this call, did you receive information that you got from dispatch prior to arriving? They uh, said that Mr. Kelly said he had struck something. That's all I remember from the, and I headed straight over there to the, from where I was at. And you heard that on dispatch, so that was in your mind when you're out there. Mr. Kelly said he struck something, right? Yes. Did you later learn that that was not accurate? Uh, what, that he had struck something? That Mr. Kelly had never said he had struck something. I'm not even sure. I haven't reviewed the radio logs, right? I mean, the recordings, but- So um, you don't know who reported that or how it got transmitted to dispatch, right? You don't know, right? No. Uh, I heard, I know they said it was from Border Patrol. So Mr. Kelly calls Border Patrol, Border Patrol calls dispatch, and then dispatch puts something out to you, correct? Yes. Did he? Did you notice any blood stains? Did you see anything like that? I saw like on um, this area, um, blood stain. Okay, and that's when you were standing further away after you. Yeah, went I never got next to the body, you know, just from the distance I was at. So I saw. And as far as you know, other than taking the dogs away from the area where the body was located, did did they do anything to protect the crime scene at that point? Did who? Did anybody that you know of do anything to protect the crime scene at that point? I left with the dogs and uh, Sergeant Rodriguez remained there. From there on, I did. I don't know uh, what happened there, but he stayed. Uh, he stayed there. Was it dark outside? It started getting dark. I don't have the answer. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Deputy. Was there anyone around to protect this crime scene from? Uh, yes, Sergeant Rodriguez. So, was there anyone? in the area that you needed to like protect the crime scene from? That's the question. Is this a rural area? Yes. Is there anybody on the property other than Mr. Kelly who's with you that you're aware of? Uh, at that time, no. Uh, I know that probably his wife was in, in, in the house, but I'm not sure if she was or not. Are there crowds of people milling around that you need to make sure don't make their way to the body? No. And 
And you just pointed a minute ago during cross-examination to where you saw a blood stain on the victim. Could you uh, could you point to that again? To, to what? Where you said you saw the blood stain on the victim. Somewhere in this area. Can you stand Someone? up and show the jury, please? The body was laying face down, so I was able to see from where I was standing, which was not next to the body. I was a few feet, but I did see some stain in this area. I mean, I'm not sure if it was right, right in here or here, but it was on the right side. So somewhere on the right side, and if I tell me if I'm describing this correctly, you're describing sort of in the torso area, is that right? Either on the side or in the back. Torso area in, on this leg. The right side of the torso area either on the side or in the back, is that right? Yes, some, somewhere in there. I mean, I, I didn't look at that. I, I could see the stain, but I um, didn't exactly the point, but I, I did see blood. On the right side of his? On the, his right side, yes. And he's laying face down, so on the back? Yes. <clears throat> and the issue with your, your report, you corrected that, is that right? Yes, I did. And your recording actually went directly into evidence. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. So if anyone wanted to listen to your recording, they could have listened to it right away without your report, correct? Yes. So you don't know if anyone ever actually relied on that error in your report, do you? I don't know. Does anyone at the Sheriff's Department have body cam? Not that I know of. And did they at this time in January, on January 30th of 2023? No, I, I don't think there's nobody, anybody with cams. So you're, the only way you can record is with those recording devices that you referred to, is that right? Yes. And defense counsel asked you about the area where you were and how long it took you to get to the, get to the Kelly residence. Could you describe how you had to, how you had to drive to get there? When the call came up, yes. So I was second on, call. Second call. Yes, I was. Um, so if you take the cane, it leads to um, to the the road where I was at, which is FSR forty six sixty seven. When I was in that area, I was I mean, like always, like we do, we, we just check to see since it's near the border, just check both drive slow and check to see if there's anybody you see any movement. So I was quite in. I remember how much further uh to the to the from the came to the from that uh but um uh, when i heard the call i was like looking out and then i started coming back okay to the area and then you have to drive uh well, on yeah. came then on chemo springs then on sagebrush then towards the house so it's, it takes several minutes to get there so it's kind of a roundabout way to get back to the kelly residence yes the Forest Service, or the National Forest, does that is that adjacent to the Kelly property? The, yes. And does the Forest Service road go along the area adjacent, not exactly adjacent to the Kelly property, but near the edge of the Kelly property? Yes, uh, it's probably south of the property or southeast, but because um, they turn around, they, they, they curve around, and so I don't know where his property ends. Okay. Um, but for sure, it's 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 it's, it's his property is in the area, but I'm not in the property. I'm like heading towards the border and, and those sites on the okay. those those roads that that uh, there's several of them, not just one. I mean, so let's talk the about the main forest service road. Does that go north and south? A okay. cane? No, the main forest service road. Does that go north south? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know because okay. it, it curves around at some point, right? Yeah, there's curves. You gotta go and and then. Go down a ravine or, or wash and then cross it and then keep going. But it's not, they're not straight roads. They're, they're curved roads and they interconnect with other service roads. I don't think I have any other questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. Any questions? <laughs> any questions for this witness from members of the jury? Very well. I see none. Did you have a question, sir? Okay. I thought you were writing something else. Thank you. All right. Uh, sir, you can step down. And is this witness excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Excuse me, thank you. State calls, next witness. And the state calls, Dr. Tim. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was I mean, I was like, let's collect the transcripts. Now, we're going to pause real quick. There's a couple things. Um, Duncan Idaho's saying for $5, no, it's subdued. As a subdued, come on. My bad. My bad. Um, Tabaki is a new member. Um, or Tabakai is a new member. Thank you for the support. And then Let's Go Brandon for four ninety nine says, Clyde can fix it. Let him take a turn at the keyboard. Come here, bud. Speaking of that, it was like perfect timing. Hey. Hey. Mm. Bigelberry, come on. Hey, Clyde. You like you perfectly timed that. Come here, jump up on me. Hi, buddy. Ah. Okay. So then Luxie, you have a question. You're saying, wait a minute. The transcript is not evidence. Oh, he can hear thunder? Well, I guess we're trying to get thunder finally. Um, so the transcript is not evidence in this situation. That is not a court-certified transcript. That was prepared by the officer. He typed out what he thought he heard. So it's not an actual evidentiary item. Um, if this was a person who had done a deposition and they're dead or previous testimony... That's where you'd have like an actual transcript transcript done, and that could be evidentiarily introduced. So no, this was just it was a it was an aid to help the jury understand and listen to the phone call. And the defense obviously wanted it because obviously they could show, look, and the judge even said, What you hear is the evidence, not this. And they had to point out this cop completely misheard things. So um it's not that's why there's uh no that I, I hope that answered your question. Um, when it's done by a court reporter, then it's like evidence. You know, you can introduce it. That does not have an indicative of reliability to it because the cop is not a transcriptionist. But Clyde, here you go. Uh, he does not like thunder. Thunder scares him a little bit because he's such a little dog. He's such a little dog. When he goes, brrr. You know, especially like we're in bed, he comes with, like, he runs up to the top of the bed and like right under the covers, hides. Um, Brandon says, if Chili's dumb enough to keep posting phone calls, I'll shit myself. Apparently he did one today. Um, Steven 2.0 is saying, um, uh, or Steven Cooper is saying for $2, do you see the Savannah Graziano shooting this morning? Yes, I did. We're going to have to go through that. I'm going to have to watch, like, we're going to have to cover that, uh, I don't know, this week, maybe on, like, uh, I'll, maybe we'll cover it on Thursday night. Uh, but yes, the fact that nobody's in trouble is fucking ridiculous. If Brimstone's saying funny, I think they should have charged him what they have presented so far. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, it's a great shoot. I think it's reasonable to charge him. Personally, I wouldn't have. But the things that have happened here have made this like, it could go either way. It could easily go either way. So I don't blame you for saying that or thinking that at all. And will this work better if I focus it in? Oh, there, there we go. We look better. It's just we looked really bad in that view. Um, Harry so Stevens says, I had a cop completely mischaracterize my statement in a police report. I'll never talk to him again. They'll just say whatever. Very true. Or he messed up. He could lie or mess up, and you don't know the difference. Um, Kelly is not in custody. That is correct. He is not in custody. No, he is not. Um, it sounds like by the jury questions, they're going to want to convict him. A couple of them, maybe. But remember, he just needs one. He just needs one. Karis is not that little. How dare you say something about my Clyde Bear. My poor little Clyde Bear. He is not going to let, he is not going to let you. You're not going to hear those words. Enter your ears, Clyde. I love you too much, Bubby. Clyde's like, I am not fat. I like eating food. But I am not fat. Um, your camera might need to be raised a couple to a few inches. Well, I'm 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 leaning back because I have Clyde, and because if I sit forward, he feels like he's gonna fall. So, did you see an interlocutory appeal appeal in this case? By the way, a marriage privilege question. No, I did not see that. Yeah, he's just really fluffy. He's going to get a haircut next week. And you'll see, he's not really, uh, I mean, yeah, he's like, he's like, why are you pulling my hair? I'm not fat. Uh-oh. 
Well, I guess we are going to get storms tonight. I can hear them now. Ooh, it's getting dark out there. And I don't mean the racist way. It's okay, Bubba. It's okay. Aw. Aw, you're okay. I'm just trying to dig under my arm. Aww. Do you want down? Do you want down, Bubba? Here, I'll put you down. Are you gonna go? Yeah, he wants to. He wants protection. Lasher's mom says the cops came to talk to my kid. I told him no. The cop wrote in his police report I hated the whole department. So why you record that? You record that interaction because then when that doesn't happen. That's why you always record your interviews. So like I said, the one thing Chili says that I agree with, when you're dealing with the cops, phone's on. So, all right, guys. So here we go. We're going to keep going. Um, I believe this is the medical examiner. I'm Dr. Krista Tim, T I M M. And where do you work? In? I work at the Pima County uh, Medical Examiner's Office. So you don't work for the county? You don't work for the Sheriff's Department here in Santa Cruz County? No, I do not. You don't work for Sheriff? You don't work for Santa Cruz County in any capacity, right? Correct. Now, sometimes, sometimes the county, like Santa Cruz, will ask for the services of Pima County to help out with cases like this, right? Yeah, we cover uh, medical examiner office duties for uh, Santa Cruz County and various other office offices in Arizona. And how long have you been with the um, your department? Uh, five years. And let's talk about your education experience. Where'd you where'd you go to school? I graduated from medical school at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I then did in a veterinary pathology, school. anatomic pathology residency at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I then did a forensic fellowship at the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office, which is now Medical Examiner's Office, also in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm board certified in anatomic. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, that's, that's they have a very good. They're not. They're not. They don't run out of work in Cleveland at the Cuyahoga County Coroner's Office. And forensic pathology. Well, how'd you get into this line of work with the autopsies? Through um, pathology training. Um, I guess I was initially exposed during my medical school training. Um, one of the pathologists there was responsible for covering the autopsy service. And um, so I was in medical school when I first saw my first autopsy and kind of just found pathology and forensic pathology through exposure. It's just a curious question how people come into the careers they are at. So that's more of a curiosity question. Um, how many autopsies have you done in your five years at Pima County? I don't have a number, but I typically am responsible for about 400 cases a year. Um, not all of those are going to be autopsies, though. What are some of the other cases you work on? Um, external examinations. Um, so if someone has trauma and they've survived it long enough to make it to the hospital, um, where they're able to make diagnoses through examination and imaging, um, such as a motor vehicle accident or something along those lines. So if the trauma is well documented, that would still follow, fall under our jurisdiction for determining cause of manner of death because it's not natural. Um, but an autopsy wouldn't be required um, most of the time for something like that because the injuries are documented. So the purpose of, would it be fair to say the purpose of an autopsy is to, to determine the manner and cause of death? No, mostly the cause of death. Okay. Is, um, of those 400 cases, how many are autopsies approximate per year? How many of them are autopsies? I, I don't I don't know maybe half. Okay. There's no test here. There's no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, I don't. It's not numbers that I keep track of. So so in five years, and you handled about two thousand cases, autopsies, and other examinations, right? Yeah, of my own, correct. Of your own. And how many how many other doctors are in that in your in your work facility in the department there? Uh, there's a chief medical examiner, a deputy chief medical examiner. There are two other full time doctors. It calls the worker bee doctors. Um, that are handling the bulk of, of the cases. And then we have a split position, so two other doctors that split a full-time position. And we also have a forensic fellow who's in training to become a forensic pathologist. 
Seven, seven or eight. Seven or eight. And up to seven, eight. Do you guys do um, like rounds? Do you guys discuss your cases with each other? Yeah, in um, various capacities, but typically our, our day starts um, meeting at eight o'clock. Uh, where the doctors who are on the schedule for autopsy service that day meet with the chief or the deputy chief, who's, whoever's running the meeting for the day, as well as people um, throughout the office, investigators, um, anthropologists, uh, the autopsy assistant staff, um, and students or people that are rotating through, we all get together for a morning, morning meeting to discuss the cases that we have to handle that day or in the short term. So it would be fair to say in the five years, you get a pretty good breadth of a variety of cases that come through that office? Yes. And you discuss those cases with other practitioners, right? That's correct. And so before you became um, at Pima County um, Coroner's Office, what was your career before that, before you stepped into Pima County? So following my fellowship in forensic pathology and becoming boarded, I stayed on at the Cuyahoga County uh, Coroner's Medical Examiner's Office. And I worked there for, as a forensic pathologist from 2010 till 2015. Um, at which point in time I took a job in Denver um, and was working as a forensic pathologist at the Denver office of the medical examiner. I worked there up until I was offered a position um, in Pima County in Tucson um, in 2019 when we moved here, or moved to Tucson. So I worked as a forensic pathologist my entire career. So let's just jump to, were you involved in a case dealing with um, a shooting on January 30th? Yes, I was. How were you involved and how, how, did, let me just, how did you get involved? I was uh, the autopsy, the autopsy physician. Um, I was, uh, it was a case that was assigned to me um, that day. And would that be just, you guys are all on call and certain people accept the phone call or someone's on duty and that's the call they take, right? Um, the schedule is made out months in advance and most days of the month there's going to be either what's called a D1 or a D2 doctor, so the primary doctor is the D1 doctor. They're going to be assigned the cases that come in that or are more complicated or that law enforcement is going to want to be in attendance for um, and then after that it's the D2 doctor is going to do the rest of the workload um, for the day typically although well, the caseload has increased and now we have a D3 doctor a lot of days so and were you asked to perform an autopsy on a body that came into your facility yes do you remember what day that was um I could look at my report sure if you want to refresh your recollection you can look at the report Just for the record, that's going to be Government Exhibit 14. On um, uh, February 1st, 2023. You remember what time of day that was? Uh, the autopsy began at 8 oh, 30. 8 30 in the morning. Correct. Do you remember the individual's name that you performed the autopsy on? Uh, Gabrielle Boutinho. I'm going to show you, just for us, not for publication, I'm going to show you a picture from your autopsy report. Do you recall that picture? I do not. You don't recall that picture? No. Oh, okay. Let me go to your, do you, your, do you have your report in front of you? I have my report, yes. Who is in attendance with you during the autopsy? Uh, myself, Detective Inza, and Deputy Barba from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, and Chief uh, Deputy Attorney Hunley from the Santa Cruz County Attorney's Office. And is what is witnessed by. And during your autopsy, what, walk the jury through what you do in an autopsy. So an autopsy is a medical procedure, um, typically for understanding the physiological or anatomic derangements that occur as to why a death comes about. Um, it starts with an external examination in which we look at the outside of the body. We're looking for any um, areas of trauma, any evidence of therapeutic intervention, any scarring. We document basic body habitus, meaning the body length and the weight, looking at the hair, the dentition, fingernails, um, just an overall appearance of the body is documented through the external examination. Um, during that process, we take pictures or um, allow for people in attendance to take pictures documenting all the things that we see. Um, and then we will move on to the internal portion of the examination in which we're looking at documenting the same things, right? So we're looking for trauma, we're looking for evidence of therapy, uh, we're looking for evidence of previous surgeries, really to, to gain an understanding as to why this person died. Um, during that process, we also can collect fluids from the body, um, blood for toxicology testing, vitreous fluid, the blood with the fluid from the eyes for toxicology or electrolyte testing, um, urine, 
anything else that might be uh, pertinent to the case that we're working on. Um, and then the, bo the body organs are removed from the body and we take weights of all the organs and then we section the organs with a knife um, to look for evidence of natural disease or documenting trauma. Um, so each organ process is processed in a similar fashion. We collect small samples that will be put in a fixative. If we wanted to look at them under the microscope, sometimes the cause of death isn't um, often um, identifiable by the naked eye, and we can look at them under the microscope so they can be embedded in paraffin and cut into glass slides which will come back to us about a week later, and we can look at those slides under the microscope. Things such as like an acute heart attack might not be visible grossly, but under the microscope, we can see the changes um, and make, make those diagnoses better. Um, and then um, pictures can be taken along the way, and then the organs are all returned into the body cavity. The body is sewn and released to the funeral home or wherever the family chooses to um, have the remains taken after we're finished. At that point in time, I will dictate uh, my findings to a transcription company who then generates a report and sends it back to me. And then I wait for the toxicology test to come back, the results from that, um, slides if they've been uh, processed, and take time and review all of all of that at the time when I'm ready to send the report out. So do you recall, and you recall this, this case, right? You recall, you recall this victim in this case, right? Yes. Do you recall how the body came to you, came to the morgue? Came to the coroner's office. I mean, do you recall how the what condition was it? A bag? Was it? Do you recall that? Uh, yeah, it was in a body bag. In a body bag. And Detective Ianza was there. Do you see him at the council table? Yes. And he was there. Yes. And did he, was he in custody of the body? Do you know? I do not know. Okay. And then was there an unwrapping of the body, unzipping of the bag? Correct. Okay. And who did that? Did you do that, or did Detective Ianza? Um, typically, that's that's what I would do. I, I look at the body bag um, and document whether there is a seal on the bag. So if the zipper has a seal around it. Um, and take a picture, and then I usually cut, cut the seal and unzip the bag. I also um, usually have uh, autopsy assistants that are helping with that process, but in cases uh, in which there's you know, suspected trauma or inflicted trauma, usually I'm the person who will remove that seal and open the body bag to expose the body and take pictures as to how the body is received in our office. Do you recall if you did that in this case? Um, most likely, yes. That's your habit? Yes. Okay. And do you, did you take photos or did the detective Anza take photos? I took photos um, and detective Anza did. We both did. I'm going to show you one of your photos in government. Exhibit 14. This is your report. Did you call it that photo? Yes. Is that the person that you you, you received for the autopsy? Correct. You're going to move to admit. I'm going to call that 14. Government Exhibit 14A is an apple. No objection, Sean. 1488 is the publisher. Hold on a second. So, you know what you're going to see. Your Honor, just for the record, I'm going to keep it very sanitized. I just want to give them a heads up. So, uh, they, uh, they both have to see it. Uh, permission. <coughs> and who's that? That's the decedent, um, Gabriel a side photo, government exhibit 14B is a boy, just for, I call that photo? Yes. Is that the same individual? Correct. You're going to move to admit exhibit 14B. Yeah. Yes, an AK patterned no rifle. Objection, sure. if you, 14B is admitted. I mean, he looks like an AK-47. That's the side angle of, of the victim, the person you, you saw that day, right? Correct. We should go to exhibit 14C, as in Charlie. Do you recognize that photograph? Yes. We're going to move to admit 14C. No objection, John. 14C is admitted. Let's walk through that. What do we see? What does the jury see in this photograph? Uh, at the top of the screen uh, is the top of the decedent's um, is the head and face from the left lateral view, um, the neck and left shoulder. There's a tattoo on the upper outer left arm, um, as well as kind of in the midline, just under the neck, um, but not the sternum. 
is the exit on shot wind. That's the exit one? That's correct. Wish you had a different angle. 14. <laughs> You recognize that photograph? Yes. Is that a different angle of the same injury? Correct. Same exit wound? Yes. Move to admit 14D as a dog. No objection, Your Honor. 14D is admitted. Permission to follow. <coughs> is that a different angle, Doctor? Yes, this is a um, similar area of the body, just from the right side of the body versus the left. I'm going to show you 14E as an echo. Do you recognize that photo, Doctor? Yes. Move to admit that move to admit 14E as an echo. No objection. 14E is admitted and that permission published. What are we looking at here? What are we looking at now? Um, so this is the, the back of the body. The first, or the last two pictures we looked at were the front of the body. This is after the body has been turned over. Uh, we're looking at the right kind of back side. So the right arm is going to be towards the right side of the screen. The head is at the top of the screen. The feet will be at the bottom of the screen. It's, all we see here is the waist. Um, and then just under the right arm, on the lateral right back, or the side of the right back, is the entrance gunshot wound. That's the entrance? That's correct. The entry wound. So I want to show both of them together. Flip flop. So that's my entry wound, correct? Correct. That's 14 E as an echo. And I'm going to show you 14 C as in Charlie. And that's the exit wound, right? Correct. So can you explain how that works? How was the, what's the bullet doing with the body, the entry and exit wound? So typically, um, in general terms, entrance gunshot wounds are generally going to be more round and regular, um, have smoother margins. They will typically have an associated marginal abrasion that's usually smooth and rounded as well. Um, as the bullet pushes through the skin, it creates that abraded margin. It's hot and it's moving fast. Um, and as it pushes through the skin, um, it also pushes through whatever is underlying that skin. If it's bone, um, and especially if it's flat bone, it can create a, a characteristic fracture pattern to that bone. So specifically the skull or flat bone being the sternum, um, sometimes ribs, are also flat bones, uh, in which as the bullet pushes through it, it causes what is called beveling, um, in which an entrance gunshot wound will have internal beveling, meaning that there's a punched out margin on the inside of that bone, versus an exit gunshot wound will have external beveling. Um, so as the, as the bullet is leaving the body, pushes through that bone, it breaks outwardly. Um, so internal beveling, entrance, external beveling, exit for flat bones. Tubular bones, which are the bones of the extremities, are, are not um, typically, gonna, you're not going to have those features associated with them. Um, so it's something that we see most commonly with the skull, um, but we look forward in other areas of the flat bones as well. So you can determine based upon the injury, injury and exit. Correct. And just so the jury knows, 14 E is neco, that is an injury wound in your opinion. Correct. That's the right flank side of the victim. The lateral right back. And 14 C is in Charlie. You can tell, in your opinion, that's an exit wound. That's correct. And so can you tell the jury the trajectory of the bullet that's going through? I mean, is it easy for you to describe and show how that bullet is traveling? Sure. Um, the, it, it's going from the right to the left, and it's going from the back to the front and upward in the body. It's the trajectory of the bullet in the body. And what, in your autopsy finding, what does it, when that bullet enters the victim's body, what is it going through? What, what organs and bones and tissue does it go through? Can I refer to my Sure. Yeah. After perforating uh, the skin and soft tissues of the right lateral back, it goes through the posterior lateral right, sixth and eighth rib, sixth, seventh, and eighth ribs, all of them, um, intercostal soft tissues, so that's like the muscles and arteries and veins between the ribs is intercostal soft tissues. Um, there's associated internal beveling of the ribs that are fractured. It then passes through the right lung with injuries of the lower, middle, and upper lobes of the right lung. Um, 
the pericardial sac, which is the fibrous lining around the sac of the heart, around the heart, and the ascending aorta. So the aorta is the major artery that leaves the heart that supplies oxygenated blood to your whole body. Um, the ascending part of, it, part of it is the first, very first part after it leaves the heart. Um, and then it goes through the sternum, which is the chest plate um, in the middle of the chest, and the uh, anterior left second rib, which is right next to the sternum. And there's external meddling, which is, as we talked about, associated with exit gunshot wounds. And then it passes through the soft tissue and the skin of the left chest. Um, there's associated fractures, hemorrhagic lacerations, and uh, retained blood uh, in the sac around the heart. There's 50 milliliters of blood in the sac that's surrounding the heart. There's not supposed to be blood in that space. There's typically just a very small amount of clear fluid that serves as kind of a lubricant for the heart when it pumps. Um, there's not supposed to be blood in that space at all. And there's 50 milliliters of blood in that space. And there's also 340 milliliters of blood in the right chest cavity. Again, there's not supposed to be red blood freely flowing around your lungs um, on the right side of the heart or the right side of the chest. Um, and there's 340 milliliters in the right chest cavity. Would that be significant injuries to the body? Very significant, yes. Is, when you say there's blood flowing in the body, would that be like consistent with internal bleeding? Correct. This is um, the blood that is uh, still within the body cavities that I'm able to measure at the time of autopsy. And just so we understand, bullets coming through the, the right lateral is coming out through the chest, mid plate chest area, right? Correct. I'm going to show you Gerb Exhibit 14F. Do you recognize that photo? Yes. What's that a photograph of? It's a, it's a closer up picture of the entrance gun challenge. You're going to move to admit 14F. No objections. 14F is admitted with no permission. All right, just, you already said it, but just explain one more time what, what we're looking at. Here. This is a closer up picture um, with a ruler of the entrance gun shot wound of the decedent. Um, you can see the central defect and as well as the uh, marginal abrasion, that pink area around it um, is where that superficial layer of skin gets um, rubbed off as the bullet pushes through the body, the skin. Is there something to be said about the, the shape of the injury wound? In your opinion, anything about the shape of the injury wound? It's, I mean, it's ovoid. It's kind of oval, has an oval shape to it. It's just a description, but. I wouldn't call it an irregular, which is what we typically see with, ex, uh, with exit gunshot wounds. This is more rounded and regular with marginal abrasion consistent with an entrance gunshot wound. Let me now show you one more photo, 14G as in <coughs> giraffe. Recognize that photograph? Yes. And what's that photograph of? This is an exit gunshot wound, the exit gunshot wound. You're going to move to admit 14G in evidence? No objection. 14G has admitted and you have permission to publish. Walk the jury through what we're seeing on this photograph. This is the exit gunshot wound. Um, it's more irregular, it's not as rounded, it has kind of angulated um, margins to it. Do you recall if you, the, the age of the, the victim in this case, the age of this person? Um, 48 years old. And did you have a, a conclusion to what had happened to him? A finding? Yes. What's your finding in this case? A perforating gunshot wound of the trunk. Is that consistent with a homicide? Uh, the manner of death is homicide, yes. Manner of death is homicide. And you said some of the blood, you, you took out the organs and some blood and you bisected the, the organs and you sent the blood out for testing? Is that what you did? Uh, yes, uh, the organs were examined after they were removed from the body and blood was collected at the time of examination um, in, in addition to the fluid from the eyes and urine uh, and they were sent to the toxicology lab for a toxicology screen. Just one second, Your Honor. As I'm looking, when you when you conclude your autopsy, what's the standard protocol we could do with the victim's body? 
uh, the, but the organs go back in and uh, the body is sutured and um, I release the body after I've finished with everything, we've gotten everything we need. Um, the body will be released to typically it's a funeral home um, that the family has made arrangements with. You, take, you recall taking like no clippings and hair and other items from the victim's body? Um, in cases such as this, that's typically a routine. Uh, it is done at the request of the investigative agency, and it's usually not done by myself. It's done by the people that are assisting me. Yeah, I'm going to show you, this is the only one you're on, I'm going to show, but I'm going to show you a picture of the, of, a, of the injury, one well, parts of the injury inside the body. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as 14H. Recognize that photograph? I do. And what's that photograph of? It's um, the right chest cavity from the inside after the lungs and heart have been removed, and the lining over the lung, the inside of the ribs has been removed. Um, so the pleura is that lining across the lungs that we uh, strip it away. Um, and then it shows the area of fractures on the right lateral chest, um, the rib fractures specifically. From the injury? From the inside of the body. You're going to move to publish 14H as in house? No objection. 14H is admitted, you're going to publish. So that's, one more time, just walk us through that. You, and you can draw the board on the screen too. Just walk us through what we're looking at on that photograph. You can't, you can't, can you draw it? Maybe. Oh. I haven't tried. There you go. Okay, uh, so this is the this is the vertebral column here from the inside of the body. So your spine, the spine. Um, these little yellow white areas are going to be the ribs, and the paint between them is that intercostal soft tissue, mostly muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, um, and so the lungs and heart have been removed. This is the area of injury. So on the outside, we saw the skin uh, and transgunshot wound. This is looking at the inside of the wound, and here you see these irregular areas. Um, these are all fractures of those ribs on the right, um, as well as it shows the external beveling on, on the ribs that were uh, injured by the, gun, the gun, gunshot wound bullet. Did you find in your autopsy, did you find any fragmentation of any bullet inside the body? No. Do you find any, you know what the difference between a full metal jacket and a hollow point is, for example? If you don't, don't worry about it. I'm not a ballistics expert. I have a general idea, um, but it's not my area of expertise. But there's no bullet fragments found in the victim's body, was there? That's correct. And you're familiar with gunshot wounds? Yes. Of, of the five years you were with Pima County, how many gunshot wound autopsies do you think, estimate, how many you've worked on and been counseled on? Too many. Um, Too many. And in your opinion, have you, have you seen the difference between, say, a handgun injury versus a long rifle or longer type gun? Yeah, I mean, I've seen shotgun wounds, I've seen rifle wounds, um, I've seen a lot of handgun wounds. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, <coughs> probably a hundred um, just homicides. Most of those are going to be gunshot wounds, um, and that doesn't even include the suicide gunshot wounds that I see, which are many more than the homicides. And in your opinion, with the we got the entry wound, we have the damage we just saw, and then we also have that exit wound. In your opinion, would that be from a handgun, a shotgun, or a, a gun like a long rifle or something different? Objection, your honor. Um, she said she wasn't a ballistics expert, wouldn't have that. She just generalizes the type of weapons that she comes across from the knowledge that's given to her. So I don't think she personally has that skill set to be able to identify the type of weapon. I'm not saying that the actual weapon, I'm talking about the difference between a handgun, shotgun, and rifle. And she's, she's testified she's seen, quote, too many. And so she's seen all three type of injuries in her career. And so I think she can opine on what type of weapon was used for this injury. The objection is sustained for lack of foundation. Try to lay additional punishment. Dr. Tim, um, of the homicides that you've dealt with, or you include the suicides, they've used uh, most, uh, sadly, said most of them are gun related, right? Yes. And, the, and those gun related, you, how, many, how many times have you seen a handgun used in either a homicide or a suicide? The majority. The majority. And when a handgun is used, it, in your opinion, you, I'm sorry, back up, strike that. When you review a body from a handgun injury, you see the type of damage that that, that handgun can cause, right? Yes. And you can see the internal organs of the body too. I mean, you do the same kind of analysis, like in this case, with the handgun injury, right? Yeah, gunshot wounds are, are processed uh, in a similar fashion, yes. So you see the entry wound? Yes. You see the exit wound? Correct. And you see the damage inside the body? Yes. 
right? You also have done cases with a shotgun. Yes. So you've seen the entry wound. Yes. You've seen the exit wound. Correct. And you also see damage within the body. Yes. You also have done cases with a rifle, right? Yes. You see the entry wound. Yes. Exit wound. Correct. And damage within the body. Yes. Are they different? Um, they can be very different. Yes. Can be very different. What's the difference between, say, a handgun versus a long gun? Um, long gun rifle wounds tend to be more devastating. They're higher power, um, um, so there's going to be more damage to the organs than just uh, a handgun. It's a lower velocity. Um, so they tend to be less um, destructive to the organs. And, and are you able to give a determination in this case by looking at it with your experience? Or are you, don't give me a determination yet, but are you able to give a de 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 uh, determination of what type of weapon was used which caused the entry, exit, and damage within the body? The uh, findings at autopsy are most consistent with uh, a rifle. Sure. I, would, I think that's it, but I think I laid the foundation for the answer, Judge. May I take the witness on board on Better at the static. So. They all look like they're at a call center. <laughs> uh oh, oh, we're already. Oh, oh. Judge strikes the answer. So the, the last answer is stricken. The last answer is stricken because it called for a yes or no answer. The question called for a yes or no answer. It was specifically phrased that way. And then the witness. They have misinterpreted the question. I don't know, but the witness did not answer yes or no. She gave the answer. So that answer is stricken. You should not consider it as part of uh, as part of the evidence in this case. Now, while I'm, I'm going to allow defense counsel to what we call more argue the witness. Now, when it comes to like more experienced people, I think she means there's like people more experienced in those areas that handle those answers. Thank you, Your Honor. In your training, have you you said you didn't have any ballistics training, correct? I have ballistics training in the sense that it's part of forensic pathology training, um, but not in the sense that I'm a ballistics expert. And there are all different types of weapons, correct? Yes. Handguns and rifles, correct? Yes. And there are high-powered handguns um, a a a that are out there. Are you aware of that? Yes. And you're trying to testify that a high-powered handgun could have not um, produce this type of injury? I guess it's possible. Okay, but you formed an opinion and I'm trying to figure out where you're getting this opinion. In a lot of your cases, you might have been given the variable of what gun is suspected to be utilized in a shooting, correct? Yes. As a matter of fact, you get a narrative and, and there's one in this case where a detective or an investigator puts out there what they believe might have happened, right? Yes. So sometimes when you're forming opinions of types of wounds, you're being provided the information of what type of gun it might be. Isn't that true? Correct. But you weren't trained in distinguishing all the different types of guns and the wounds that it's capable of producing, correct? Not all of them, no. Okay, and there's a lot of guns on the market. Would you agree? Yes. And would you also agree that distance can make a difference of how the wound might look, correct? Yes. And the caliber or the type of bullets that come out of a gun shotgun versus a BB gun obviously would be different, right? The types of wounds that you could expect to see. Can you repeat the question? That bullets can make a difference on the type of wounds that might be seen by you. The size of the bullet? Yes. Uh, the state asked you about hollow point and different types of other bullets, right? Correct. And in this case, there is no bullet, is there? Uh, there's no retained bullet. You were not shown any bullet that came from this case, correct? Correct. And you didn't find a bullet, correct? Correct. So you have no idea if this is a high-powered, larger type of bullet from a handgun or from a long rifle or any other type of rifle, correct? Correct. So I will continue with my objection, Your Honor. The objection is sustained. Could you ask the jurors to please disregard? I do. Your Honor, may I try to... May I check objection sustained? Let me ask you a question, Dr. Dr. Tim.
Would this injury be consistent with a weapon, a gun? Can we just agree to that? Would this, weapon, would this be consistent with a weapon, a gun? Yes, this is a gunshot wound. The cause of death is a gunshot wound. And did you find in your analysis of the skin or clothing any kind of residue around the injury or entry and exit or clothing that you may or may not have? Did you find any gun residue? I did not uh, notice any following or sibling on the surface of the skin um, at the time of examination, which is burnt and unburnt gunpowder. Um, typically seen in intermediate range gunshot wounds. So a gunshot wound in which there is a mu muzzle to target distance. I'm gonna object, um, is, um, I believe that that was the question that she's going into her own narrative. I also state that we So we explain to it, once again, explain what stippling is, real quick, for the jury. Stippling is small punctate abrasions on the surface of the skin around an entrance gunshot wound in which it's an intermediate range meaning the distance from the muzzle of the target is a few inches up to approximately a foot and a half for most uh, weapons. And there's no such stippling in this case? That's correct. And how about gunpowder residue or residue or any of that, anything like that in this case? No. And what would that be indicative of if there was gunpowder residue on the skin? They would both, they're both seen in intermediate range gunshot wounds. Let me ask about correlating in your experience. What's the term correlating referred to? Um, bringing together information, seeing if it relates. And that's, so in this case, what, what kind of correlation do we do in this case when you look at an autopsy like this? What do you do? I mean, you're considering a bunch of data points. You're considering entry wound, exit wound, and all those things, right? Sorry. Just walk me through what kind of correlating would be happening in an autopsy like this. So January. The biggest thing is I'm, I'm looking for cause of death. Um, so I'm going to look at the body. Um, I might have a story as to how someone comes in and how the story fits with what I'm seeing on the body. Um, sometimes the story would be someone shot themselves and I do the examination and I think that that doesn't really fit the story. So there needs to be further investigation. Um, if the story was that this person was shot by someone else, I want to make sure that it's not you know, a contact gunshot wound was going to be more consistent with someone shooting themselves, or possibly no one considered that information. Um, so we want to see that the story fits what we're looking at. Were you told anything about when the, when the body comes in and you're asked to do an autopsy, were you told anything about the story in this case? Um, I don't remember specifically the exact information that I received, but I would have had some information, yes. Do you remember it being inconsistent with your findings, the story being inconsistent with your findings? No. That's the question I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Let me talk to counsel for Wonder what they're going to show now. On the injury, Doctor, you're your honor. On the gunshot, the injury and the damage to this person, um, how impactful is this on a victim? Ability to survive it or the length of time to survive an injury that you saw? So there's injury to the major artery, right, the aorta, um, which is the, the vessel that carries oxygenated blood to the heart muscle itself, to the brain, to the muscles, to all of the vital organs. Um, that right, right after it comes out of the heart, there's a, a large laceration tear through that artery. So oxygenated blood isn't going to be reaching where it needs to reach. Um, it's just going to be collecting outside of the normally closed system. Um, so life can be sustained until the reserve is gone, which is, you know, a cardiac cycle or so. Um, or um, an injury like this can be fatal pretty quickly. I wouldn't call it instantaneously lethal. Typically when we think of instantaneous, instantaneous death, it involves the brainstem. So the respiratory and cardiac centers are all within the brainstem. If we have a gunshot wound that goes through the brainstem, it's considered pretty instantaneously incapacitated death occurring. Um, here it's going to be pretty quick because it's the very large artery that is injured, injured and the blood isn't going to be going where it's supposed to be going. 
um, maybe function retained for a few minutes. It's really hard to know. There's so many variables that go into each person. Um, the underlying state of health, what the person was doing prior, um, so many different things that play into that and really no way of, of studying um, multiple people getting multiple gunshot wounds and this type of injury. Um, so an estimate would be you know, a few seconds to a few minutes. A few seconds to a few minutes? Correct. Can an individual, in a, in a few minutes, can an individual continue walking like normal or running like normal for a few minutes or is it death within a few minutes? Do you understand the difference between the two? I do, um, and both of those are, are plausible, possible. Are they, on that, on the, the distance and the, the time of death, it depends upon the victim, right? Correct. And there's no way of knowing about, would there be a blood trail, would this kind of injury cause a blood trail? Potentially, um, there are two defects from which blood could leave the body, right? There's an entrance wound and an exit wound. And so if the blood was leaking out of either of those wounds and the person was moving, there could be blood on the ground or the, he was clothed, so it could just be being absorbed by the clothing. Um, many things that I don't have an answer to, I don't know. But he could, the, the, the victim could have been stopped in his tracks and collapsed also. Yes. Could the victim, could the victim talk with this type of injury? Potentially. That's all you're on. Thank you, let me talk to counsel, please. attorney is doing a great job a very good job speaking of arizona has anybody checked on dark chauvin lately he might have been re-relocated again oh j-rock you're here good we need to get something since you're here now um guys yes the shooting did occur on january 30th so i'm watching backdraft under siege <laughs> yeah So, all right, real quick here. Um, arson investigator for 1999. Let's go! This is prosecutor must hate turtles as many straws as he's grasping at. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, we're back. Hold on. Time for rest. But we will recommence uh, at 1.30. Please be in the jury room at that time. I'll uh, excuse the jury, uh, and I'll stay here with counsel. Have a good lunch. Be right again, Lord. Thank you very much, Arson Investigator. The original backdraft, that's the only one that's good. The, I haven't even seen the new one, and I know it's garbage. Uh, there's only one good backdraft, the original. You gotta, gotta, gotta be inspecting your arson scene while smoking a cigarette. Okay. Your Honor, I'm um, speaking with counsel. Time said that one counsel is not from Arizona, but we're trying to schedule a walkthrough or a, um, a preliminary walkthrough with counsel with attorneys, and we're hoping. Hey, Ella. The scene, the, the scene. And we're hoping, if the court's amenable to it, that the attorneys get together to go to the defendant's residence tomorrow morning. We start at 1030 with the jury. It gives us an opportunity to go see the scene, report back and figure out, and it gives us an opportunity to address the court and talk about what's agreed and what's in conflict. So we're hoping to see if we can start court tomorrow at 1030, because counsel is necessary. We're busy working, going to the scene, and get the scene. Your Honor, I'm aware of this conversation, and I know it's up to the court on the timing of this. Um, defense has seen it, but we are prepared to go out and allow the state to look at it prior to the actual jurors going out. So we have no argument with that. And um, we were just trying to figure out the timing, and it was suggested by the state to do it at that time. If the court would agree, we would agree. Is there any other time? I, mean, I really hate to uh, use a trial time for that, um, especially since we talked about this before trial. 
I suggest to the parties that they do this before trial so we don't take up that time. Uh, is there any other time we can do this so that we don't use time that we otherwise use for trial? We can, we can do this weekend. I was just being courteous to counsel who is we had weekend plans. I was trying to be courteous to this. That's I, thought, I thought you were here for duration. Oh, I'm not going out of state. I just have family in different parts of Arizona, and I thought nothing was happening this weekend and arranged for my time to be in Phoenix. Since we have three-day weekend, I didn't realize that was going to be cut into. So I, I also suggest that we leave. Well, you don't no, have no. court on Mondays, so it makes it a three-day weekend for me. Since I'm in a hotel, I was scheduling something to do. I have another alternative suggestion that we leave it for, and we go directly from court out there. It's my other thought process, um, allowing the state to see it. I like that better because it allows us to recess early. If the hours are between three and five are, you know, usually when you know, people are a little tired and they're potentially less attentive than they are in the morning. So we could, uh, hmm. when is it getting dark? Excuse me. Excuse me. They're okay. going to have to hurry the hell up, though. Yes, for us to. Your Honor, as long as it's not today, we do have two witnesses today who have scheduling issues, so we just don't want to oh. handle a scheduling issue today. You, you, all you folks work it out, I think that's a better suggestion, just because it's, it's a better time of day. Um, and the jury's never disciplined on the excuse of the world. So let's try one. Right. Okay. Perfect. We'll discuss it. We'll come back. Very good. For the reasons so much. We'll be back. Mm. So, guys, what they're talking about there is they're talking about dealing with the uh, dealing with the jury view. They are going to have a jury go out to view it. They're dealing it in the middle of the case, which it sounds like the defense wanted this because now they've heard all the nonsense, and now they have to apply what they've heard. And it sounds like they've also agreed. Normally, this doesn't happen. They're going to mark out positions. Where did George Kelly said he stand it? Where did they find this body? Can you see the body from the house? All these different things through the sagebrush and the thickets and all the brambles. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, we got a we got a good portion of time here that we are off, but I need to go grab something apparently because J Rock, I know you're. Are you still here, J Rock? Um, if you are, give me one second because I need to go run grab something. And while we're doing that, uh, you know, we're gonna talk about switchies for a second. So, um, here you go, guys. Turn your sound down real quick. I warn you, you've been warned. Five. Turn your sound down. Four. Turn your sound down. Three. Turn your sound down. Two. Turn your sound down. One. I told you it's gonna get. We don't play with no rhythm, nigga. On my butter. We do. So don't play my slide. <laughs> don't post play. It will get like that. Switchy. Yeah. No top. No cap. No top. Who's game? Three switches right here. And I picked up. That, that's just oh. enough right there. That's <laughs> enough. One, two, three. That's <laughs> enough. Yeah, big we don't need to get it all. Okay, we are back. I was told uh, 2.0 says this is for me, so I've not opened it yet. No cap. Yes. So let's see what this is. <laughs> All right. She opened it. I haven't touched this. Let's see what we got. There's a note. Oh, it's just a gift receipt. It doesn't actually have a note on it. Okay. Just one thing. All right, good. And it's not ticking, sadly. Hold on. I don't know if it's going to fit. Baldo's a little too tight. Ow! Damn, why do you guys, like, you should have bought the largest Baldo you can afford. Custom order one. Jesus, you guys. What did you get for assuming I got little balls? There we go. We're back. I 
the larger they make. You know, it actually fits. It actually fits pretty good. It actually fits well enough. I can get a finger in on uh, both sides. That's actually impressive. That's impressive. So. Thank you, J-Rock. Thank you. Let's time travel in this case, guys. Let's get ready. <sighs> oh, oh, wow, they're going through a long. There was nearly a two hour uh, lunch. Yeah, that was like a two-hour lunch. We're catching up fast, chat. We're only three hours down. We're going to catch up till no time. I think they're done by now, though. Dr. Tim, are you settled in? How is it? Good afternoon, Dr. Tim. Good afternoon. Here we go, guys. Uh, let's go back over some of the evidence and talk about a few other things that might have been brushed over or not mentioned, okay? Sure. Um, so back on January 30th, uh, you learned that there was a deceased in a possible incident, correct? Correct. When did you actually learn of it? Um, most likely at the morning meeting on the day of the autopsy. Okay, what day again was that? February 1st, 2023. Okay, so I know that um, the body arrives. In what, case, in what time period did the body arrive to your location? I do not know if that would be documented um, within the case file, but that's not something that I keep track of in my records. Okay, but is it in the file itself? It, yes. Do you know where that might be located? Um, where it might be noted? Body receival time? Yes, please. Can you look? I don't have the case file. Oh, you don't have the report? I have my report. But not the full file? Correct. Okay. Now, can you just raise up so I can see the report, the size of the report that you're looking at? It's pretty thin. Uh, it's, there's I forgot to mention in case I didn't say thank you very much, J-Rock. Seven pages of my report. Okay. So at this time, Your Honor, I'd like to approach the witness. I have um, on exhibit, uh, defense exhibit AAA. I just want to show it to her. Now I have some post-its in it, so that's just for my references, okay? Can you identify what this full document is? Just look through it, peruse it, and then tell me if you know what it is. There's an affidavit on the front page. There's a copy of my CV. Which is very much like a resume for anyone that doesn't know that term, correct? It's, yes. Uh, there's a copy of Autopsy report for the deceiving. <clears throat> Toxicology report. Um, looks like the contents of the case file, probably. Fingerprints of the decedent. Um, 
um, identification card, copy of. copy of a disc, and some photographs. Do those photographs look familiar? Uh, yes, they're autopsy photographs for those seeing. Would that be the ones that you talked about that you took? Yes. And there's pictures of um, property, it looks like, and tattoos. Which was the tattoos were found on the decedent's body? Yes. And they photograph the decedent. Okay. You didn't bring this full file, did you? That's correct. Okay, so if you need it for any reason, to reference it, please let me know, okay? Yes. So you just brought in a few pages of your ultimate findings, right? I brought in my uh, autopsy report. Okay, but you're responsible for the other things that were in this whole file, right? Like the photos. Our office is. Okay, but you took the photos, correct? I took some of those photos, yes. Okay. Well, you didn't say these were detective photos, did you? No, but there's other people employed in my office that take photographs as well. But you are the lead in this medical examination of this uh, deceased, correct? I'm the physician who performed the autopsy. Okay. And so you also helped with collecting any um, stuff like blood or other fluids of the body, right? I collected blood for toxicology testing, a vitreous fluid and urine for tox toxicology testing at the um, time of autopsy and the lab came back and gets put into the file, correct? Um, the results of the testing are put into a toxicology report that is returned to us and becomes part of the file. And it was in here, wasn't it? Yes. And I'm referencing again, AAA, defense AAA. So a file is created upon receiving a person for a possible autopsy and then the different, um, areas come together, work together, and create this file, basically. Would that be a simplistic way of saying it? Yes. Okay. Now, and I do like to keep it somewhat simplistic because, you know, you know a lot. You're a doctor. You have a lot of education, don't you? I'm a physician. Okay. A medical doctor. Is that the same thing? Sure. Okay. And you've never talked to me before, have you? No. Okay. And you're not angry at me for any reason, are you? No. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, let me understand something. This, you're, you did your work, started conducting your work, you said on February 1st, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And yet, the deceased was probably transferred upon um, death and brought to your department, your office. Would that be fair to say? Can you repeat the question, please? If uh, police department, law enforcement suspect some foul play or something and want to get an autopsy, they're going to probably bring it directly to your organization? Yes. Okay. And so January 30th, um, a body was discovered, and then somewhere within hours or whatever happened, the uh, medical examiner's office would receive it either later on January 30th or very early on February, uh, January 31st, correct? Yes. And I'm gonna assume that a body is placed in a cooler of some sort, correct? Typically, yes. Okay, and it's an individual cooler, I've never been to your establishment, but uh, where um, the body is laying on a table and slides into this cooler? Um, it's not an individual cooler, it's a large walk-in cooler. Okay, how do you keep bodies separated? They're in body bags on individual tables. Okay, and they all are ID'd, I would assume, correct? 
Uh, no. We have a lot of unidentified individuals. Do you give it a number? Yes. Okay, so it is ID'd in some format, whether you know who they are before or something that you do internally, correct? They're given an identification number, yes. Okay. I didn't okay. say name, ma'am, I said ID. All right, so identification, ID is short for identification, correct? Yes. Okay. And so that's so you don't mix up bodies and get the wrong results, correct? Yes. I mean, that wouldn't be very good if you had a results of someone else's autopsy for this body. That wouldn't be very good, would it? No. So there are internal controls to prevent that. Is that right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Now, does the fact that, uh, and I don't know, I'm going to rely on your expertise here. Does the fact that a body that's placed in some form of cooler, um, does that change the timeline of things that one would expect to see as you go through the breakdown of decomposing upon death? What was the question? <laughs> does the refrigeration, the cooler, uh, help change or alter or prevent um, anything about the decomposing of a body after you know passing on? Bodies are cooled to slow the decomposition process. Thank you. Okay, so isn't it true though that there are a process of, of, of decomposing that happens upon death of each of us? Decomposition occurs after death. And, there, and that is a changing process? It's a process of decomposition. And does it stay the same or does it change? <laughs> In comparison to what? Well, how about overall appearance, overall temperature, all the things that you think about when it comes to rigor, stuff like that. I'm not sure what the question is. When, I, when a person passes, does the body change through the different process that the body goes through, whether it's rigor, body temperature, Your body changes and other things like that you might expect puberty. to see um, as the body starts to decompose? There are changes that the body goes through after death that are part of the decomposition process. Okay, thank you. All right, let's start off. What was the time of death on this, please? No real idea. The time of death is uh, 18, 24 hours. Okay, so you in this report notes that it's 1824 exact, correct? That's the time of death. Okay. And what is, what is, let's clarify for anyone, one that is not military time sabi, what does 1824 mean? 624 p.m. Okay, and what, what does it mean by exact? That's the time the body was pronounced dead. Okay. And 1824 is 624 p.m., not a.m., correct? P.m. And do you know where that comes from? The pronouncement time? Yes, please. Is when someone has notified the overseeing agency that it has someone that pronounces them dead. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure what happens in uh, Santa Cruz County who, who pronounces death here. Okay. Now, you testified that you gather information and uh, the state asked you some questions about it. Um, Hold on one second. And then you try to basically, you know, take this information that you gather and then determine how it fits with what your findings are, right? Generally speaking, yes. Correlating was the word that the state used. Remember that? Yes. And you defined it? Yes. Okay. And when you get, when you saw, um, we're gonna, I'm going to call him Gabriel because I think it's easier for you to say it too. Uh, the deceased's name, Gabriel. Um, were you able to determine when you looked at the body, what, where, how long has the body been dead? I mean, are you able to assess if that's an accurate time? That's the time of pronouncement. Okay. What did you find? Um, I documented the postmortem findings in that the body was cold, and that rigor mortis was fully fixed in the muscles of the jaw and extremities, and there was faint fixed pink rigor mortis over the posterior surface of the body except in areas exposed to pressure. And what does that tell you? So those are the postmortem changes that are examined on the decedents that come into our office. Um, upon death, 
people cool to ambient temperature. So if you're in a warmer environment, your body is going to eventually cool to the temperature of that environment. Um, the muscles become fixed uh, after people die, and that's the rigor mortis. Um, they, they become fixed up into a point in which they reach their maximum fixed. Um, and when I say fixed, it means that if you try to manipulate the body, you won't be able to, or you'll have to use great force to counteract this, the fixation of those muscles in that position. So there's a certain point where it's going to reach its maximum, and then it's going to start to fade away again. Um, and then the third is the lividity or liver mortis, which is the pooling of the blood after death. Um, it is the discoloration that you see, um, can be misinterpreted for bruising, but it's really just like a purplish pink color of the blood pooling on the dependent surfaces. So gravity plays a role there in uh, which you see that discoloration, but blood cannot pool in areas that are uh, up against something firm. So you'll see areas of pallor or paleness that are up against a firm surface, so the blood can't come there. Up until about 12 hours, the, when you push on it, it will push away, and so it blanches. After around 12 hours, after you push on it, it won't go away. So these are all things that we examine to help understand how long someone may have been dead, with the caveat that they are all variable from individual to individual, and they're influenced by environmental factors, they're influenced by why the person is dead. So someone who is... Okay, let me ask you another question. That was very thorough, thank you. But let's break that down. That's a lot of information for um, people that don't understand the science like you know it. Uh, so when you, the question was going back to when you get to see the body, when you started to perform your autopsy, which of those levels or timelines was this body at at that point of time when you started? Well, we know that the body was pronounced dead at six at six thirty the six twenty four the night prior. Um, I did the autopsy at eight thirty a.m. Um, and the body had been in a cooler, and I documented the body was cool. Makes sense. So does that not make it difficult to know about the the hour timeline that has taken place? Let me give an example. Maybe this will be more clear for you to understand me. My understanding is that the body's warm and stiff. That may represent a certain amount of hours, say three to eight hours. Don't know if I'm exact. Correct me if I'm not right. So the fact that the body's been in the cooler, how would you know if it's been within three to eight hours, if that was true? Um, typically, if, you're, if that's a concern, that's something that should be assessed at the scene. If there is a concern as to the time of the injury um, uh, versus the time of death, that would be something that would be assessed at the scene because... So let me, let me ask you about that because that's a good point. If time was an issue, okay, could someone get to you, you being the medical examiner, okay? Could someone, law enforcement, get to you expressing the urgency in determining the time by having you look at the body, uh, like, you know, urgent? We employ a team of investigators, medical legal death investigators, that respond to um, scenes where there's people that are deceased that will examine um, the postmortem changes and document that. Um, that's in Pima County. Um, okay, just in, in an event they used your county for hypothetical purposes, if that was an issue before law enforcement, they could get someone to either come out to the scene or look at the body as upon its arrival. How would that might look like? I mean, I, I imagine they can make a request for somebody to respond to a scene. Okay. But again, these findings are variable and it's not an exact science. I understand that, but if you put a body in a cooler, you're taking away any chances of having some some sort of estimate of time that the body has been deceased, correct? In, in assessing exact postmortem changes, that, that it's not even an exact science. I understand, but there's usually a range that goes with it. For example, if the body's warm and stiff, um, some of the research that I've seen says it could be three to eight hours. If that was true, let me go to the next one. Correct me anywhere where I'm just totally off. If the body is cold and stiff, now you might go from 8 to 36 hours. And then the last one is an example. If, if it's cold and not stiff, now you've gone past that rigor stage, and now you're at 36 plus hours. So it is a range, correct? Yeah, those are, those are ranges that I've seen in the literature. Okay. And so by putting a body into the cooler, so to speak, I'm sure you have a better name than I do. 
um, you're altering the potential of showing the warmth of that body, meaning the body might be fresh within, if those numbers were correct, three to eight, at three to eight hours, rather than um, now being altered with a cooler that might show it's cold and stiff, changing the times from eight to 36. Isn't that possible? Yeah, um, it's going to be cool because it's in a cooler, but we also know there's passage of time. So okay. when someone just gets put into the medical examiner, is placed into the cooler until the time of the autopsy is performed, we're losing potential information of biological um, indicators of time of death. It's possible, right? It's being slowed, yeah. Okay, it's being slowed by the cooler, but now we have altered what's natural. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so all you could go with is the time that someone reported the time of death to you. That's Correct. The time of death is the time of pronouncement, yes. Okay. And so just to conclude this area of topic, you cannot, you have pronouncement, but you can't tell me the approximate time of death of um, the deceased Gabriel in this case, right? Uh, not exactly, no. Okay. Would you concur that it, the time of death could have been six something? Six twenty-four. That's the, the time of death. Yes. So, but medically, through your assessment, are you comfortable with that time? That's the time that he was pronounced dead, so yes. I'm asking medical inquiry to the time of death through your evaluation. Does it seem, you said that you go through this process of evaluating what you learn and what you observe. I'm asking what did you observe? Does that seem reasonable? Yes. It doesn't seem like he was been dead for four days. Okay, but 624 is a reasonable time, that's all I'm asking. Yes, thank you. So in Pima County, just in case, I'm not sure everyone here has lived here forever, but where, what city is Pima County out? Tucson is in Pima County. Okay. And is that where the office is located? Pima County Medical Examiner's Office is in Tucson. Thank you very much. Now you said you had numerous people there watching the autopsy, correct? Correct. The detectives, the prosecutor. Do you have help with staff while you're conducting it? Yes. How many people do you normally have help you? Um, Typically one or two. Okay. And, and just basically, what's their role? Um, doing the paperwork, printing off labels, um, putting labels on body fluids that I collect, helping with collection of evidence, doing the evidentiary form, releasing the evidence to the investigating agency, um, maybe helping with photographs if their gloves are clean and mine are dirty, um, and helping with the investigation process and the returning of the organs to the body and sewing the body up, um, transporting the body to and from the cooler, and helping with anything else that I might need along the way. Okay. So it's sort of like if you were a surgeon and you would have physician assistants or nursing that would be assisting in you overseeing and doing your medical procedures, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, now on your findings, you list two, po two points. Can you revisit those two? What are they? A perforating gunshot wound of trunk with skeletal soft tissue, vascular, and visceral injuries. And Roman numeral two is cutaneous abrasions and contusions. Okay, I think we talked a little bit about the first finding. What is the second finding about? And there were other injuries that I noted and documented on the uh, skin. And you explained in the process that you go through an autopsy that the first thing you do it's like an assessment of the outer parts of the body, correct? Correct. And I would assume that's when you noted some abrasions. Correct. And in layman's terms, is an abrasion like a scraping of the skin? Yes. Okay. Just like a skin knee would be an abrasion? Correct. Okay, so something that scrapes against it caused some kind of markings, correct? Or it scrapes against something. Yes. One or the other contacts each other, but it causes the scraping. Correct. Right? And so, let's see here. Where in your report do you have um, noted some abrasions? Under evidence of injury section, okay, can on you, page four. On page four, can you please tell us out loud what are those locations? On um, the bridge of the nose. 
in the right forearm, the left knee, and the front of the left leg. Now, when you say the front, I imagine there's the part above the knee and, the, and a part below. Did you note it in any particular location? Upper leg or lower leg? Well, it's the thigh and the leg. The thigh is above the knee, the leg is below the knee. Thank you. I can't remember my signs that well. Thank you. Um, From the autopsy. From the what now? The autopsy. Okay. And does it reflect the locations of these abrasions that you were noting? The first picture is corresponds to the second injury on the right forearm. The second picture corresponds to the uh, fourth and fifth injuries on the left knee and leg. The third picture corresponds to the first injury on the nasal bridge, as does the fourth picture. Okay, so this, these photos accurately depict the photos that you or someone in your team took of these abrasions, correct? And contusion. And contusion, okay. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to enter into evidence uh, PP, defense PP. No objection. PP is admitted. Permission to publish? She's doing good, guys. What are we looking at? And we'll call this a first photo in my stable group here. What are we looking at? On this one? In the middle. So far, I'm not convinced he did anything illegal. The state's not meeting the burden. The defense is actually doing a pretty good job. So the screen is the abrasion on the right forearm. The hand is going to be on the right side of the screen as you're looking at it. And the shoulder elbow region would be towards the left side of the screen. All right. And let the record reflect that I'm pointed towards the hand, which is looking at the screen to the right. And to the left would be the rest of the room, correct? So this is just above the wrist? Correct. Okay. Kind of, would the hand be kind of flat if you were taking the picture? It looks like the palm is facing down and the back of the hand is facing towards the top of the screen. So this appears to be the sidearm above the wrist? Uh, the forearm. The forearm. Thank you. Side of the arm above the wrist. The forearm. Side of the forearm. Thank you. Let me show you the next slide. Okay, what are we looking at here? We'll call this B. On the left side of the screen is the thighs uh, with the knees and then the anterior surface of the legs and the feet. Uh, the left leg is uh, towards the top of the screen, the right leg is towards the bottom of the screen, and you can see an area of uh, red, purple discoloration that is the injury right on the left knee, as well as an additional area on the anterior surface of the left leg. Here. Correct. Okay. So I pointed to the left knee, and below that, another injury, and nothing on the right side? That's correct. Now we've seen this with the states a bit, but since it's in my packet, I'm going to show it again, and we'll move to see what are we looking at here that you've seen before. Uh, this is a, a front picture of the decedent's face, um, and you can see the area of injury on the bridge of the nose. All right, blew up the picture. I zoomed it in. And am I pointing in the right direction on the bridge of the nose? 
Yes. Apologize, I have to show the jurors all this, but I'm going to give the last one to this group D. What are we looking at here? These are pics, guys. These are pics from the autopsy. That's why they're all blurred out. Because it's all from the autopsy. They can't show them. Yes. So do I, but we're not allowed to. This area right here, right pointing. Correct. And these are abrasions. That's an abrasion, yes. A bruise is usually from impact, right, and it caused some form of bleeding under the skin. A bruise is a contusion. Um, which is also a type of blunt force injury. So a contusion is bleeding underneath the skin that rises and allows us to see off color. A contusion is bleeding underneath intact skin. Okay, so there's no open wound usually with a contusion. Not with a straightforward contusion, no. Okay. And but an abrasion is more not of a direct impact, but more of a scraping of, correct? Uh, it's blunt force injury, so uh, it just has a different appearance. It's the loss of a superficial layer of skin. Okay. That's an abrasion or a scrape. And something causes that resistance to cause it to have that appearance versus just a bruise, correct? And they're both a result of blunt force injury, blunt trauma. You know, right. Something impacting the body or the body impacting something blunt. But if I fall and skin my knees, it's because it scraped along the pavement or whatever versus just fell direct down, which might just cause bruising, correct? Um, there's different variables that play a role in it. If it's against a rough surface and it just fell down, you still may have an abrasion from it. Can a dragging cause an abrasion? Yes. When the body comes in, is the body naked or do you have clothing on it as you, as it was, you know, when it arrives? It depends on where the body comes from. So in this case, do you know if the body was clothed before you did your job? Yes, the body was received clothed. So if there was a photo that showed tears in the clothing and underneath it an abrasion. Does that support the fact that there could have been like it, like skinning the knee, that type of injury? Yes. So in other words, if there's a tear above the abrasion that supports that something came in contact with resistance to that area, correct? Yes. Thank you. Did you note any of that in, in your observations or was that not your job to do that? I don't look at clothing. So you have no idea if this body has been dragged. You can't say one way or the other, correct? Correct. But it's possible? Yes. Okay. Now, but did you testify about the clothing and the bullet defect and the regular defect? Did you have some testimony about that? Not that I recall. Okay. Let's talk about directionality of these um, bullet holes that you've observed. You don't know which way the subject would have been standing or sitting or doing whatever. You're not here to testify. You have any knowledge of that, correct? Correct. Okay. What about the angle of this wound? Are you here? You do know there was an angle from the entrance to the exit, correct? That's correct. Okay. Your Honor, may I do a demonstrative uh, thing with the court? My new friend. We're going to bring out. Any objection, please? No, here. May I approach the witness? Several of the witnesses. This is not a real, real human being, right? No, no. I doubt it. I'm not sure, though. But it is anatomically correct from what you can see, correct? That's how the system is. So I'm a visual person. I know jurors can be too. So what I'd like to ask if you would step down from your seat and help demonstrate this, okay? 
this rod and I want you to point out let you hold it while you start your talk you talked about some damages or beveling of the ribs let's back up a little bit explain beveling one more time the beveling beveling is a, a fracture pattern seen on flat bones so what does that mean why does it do that why do you have that pattern it's the way the bullet passes through the flat bones and pushes uh, the surface of the bone with it Okay, sometimes beveling is almost like a uh, polishing type thing that it does too. Is that similar or something different? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Does it, is it a direct impact or a skimming of that location to cause that? It can be both. Okay. Now, when you talk about rib numbers, how do you count ribs to know which rib we're talking about? From the top down. Okay. And you said there was an entrance wound where? Rib number, if you do look at your report, we can get that for you. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it memorized. It's for lateral right. Post to lateral right six through eight ribs. Okay, point right now where that would be. These three ribs here, six, seven, and eight. This is kind of the posterior lateral region. These ribs. Okay. Still kind of high up, depending on the size of the person, right? I don't have an opinion to that. Okay. Now, where is the exit wound? Anterior left, second, right next to the sternum, the fracture of the sternum, and this area of the second rib. Can you put this rod through the location of the entrance as close as you can and show where it would look like if it, where the bullet exit is placed? Let me hold your report. Roughly in that area. Now you named three ribs where it entered in. Where did you place it between those three? Uh, below the seven. Okay. Now, so you said six through eight, right? Correct. So you just took the middle row for that, correct? Yes. Okay. Why would a bullet hit three ribs? Um, because of the velocity associated with it. What about the angle? Turn them a little bit just so jurors can see different perspective. If something was lower and went into an upward movement, is it possible that the angle caused the impact damage to more than one rib? I'm not sure what that question is asking. If I was down low shooting upward, is it possible the projectile hit more than one rib, causing the fracture or the break? Um, you would expect a more direct or upward uh, trajectory for that to happen. It would have come this way, not crossing the line. Do the ribs at all the bones affect the possibility of a change in the direction? Is that possible? Um, fractures and going through bone are going to change the projectile. Will? Yes. Okay. So once the bullet comes through, and hits the body, hitting, going past the skin and hitting, say, a rib or a bone. Could that alter the change to some degree? Is that what you're saying yes to? Well, it, it altered the trajectory from when it was outside the body to when it was inside the body. It now has its own trajectory because of what it's impacted. Right. And so not only did it hit these three, potential these three ribs by the sign of the injury, right? It went through soft tissue after, correct? Uh, before. After it hit, the, okay, it went through soft tissue, then hit the ribs. Correct. Okay, then it went through some more soft tissue or organs. Organs. Like the heart. Lung. Lung. First. Okay, and that's a soft tissue, correct? But ultimately passing through, it hit another set of ribs before it exited, correct? Uh, it hit the sternum 
and then the second rib. Okay, tell us what a sternum is. It's a flat bone, like a breastbone. Yeah, it's the sternum. Okay, so let me look and see what you're pointing at. So it's the center bone that kind of connects the ribs and joins them together? Yeah. Okay, so if I point to my front right here, what, am I likely to be near my sternum? Yes. Okay, and I'm illustrating the center mass of my chest. Okay, and so it hits that bone, and then where on this was there another possible fracture or broken bone? The second rib is broke, so it comes through here. Okay. And what part of the bone did you notice that injury to? The anterior, right? Parasternal. Close to the sternum. Yes. Versus where on the back, let me flip our guy around. Where on this ribs did you notice the injury? Like inner closer to the spine, outer, give me an idea there. Right where I have it, poster lateral. Okay, that was the easy one for you to put through. Because that's where you saw it, right? Correct? Okay. You got a question next. All right, keep sitting down. Thank you. Now I know you're not here to explain or give explanations, but would it be unreasonable to think that the directionality of this bullet could have been at a lower elevation? Is that possible? I'm not familiar with bullets in elevation. But it starts lower, correct? The, the, the entrance and proceeds upward, correct? That's the trajectory through the body. Right. So if I was sitting right here on the floor, very low, it's possible that it would, just common sense, that it would fall, it would follow this pattern of entrance and exit, correct? That's a possibility. So if someone is at a lower elevation, is it possible? I'm not making you the expert, I'm just speaking with your knowledge and common sense that this could have been a lower elevation like crouching shot shoot. that caused it go from down to upward, correct? If the body was in a, an upright position, yes. Okay. And there's other explanations, right? Innumerable. Right. And the maybe, is, maybe. You know, correct? I don't know the, I know the trajectory of the bullet through the body. Right. And we can see it now with this rod in there that it starts low and goes high. That we do know, correct? Yes. And so all the possibilities that could be out there, we just don't know how this happened, right? I do not. Right. Now, you told us and testified about the amount of blood that was retained in this body upon your autopsy, correct? Correct. You also talked about a couple of different ways that one might pass. One, you mentioned, like, say they're shot in their head. What does that do as far as longevity of that person? It's highly variable. People can survive that shot wounds to the head. Depends where it is. Yes. Um, if they, if a bullet affects the central nervous system, would they be able to abstain for any length of time? Yes. How long? Well, they can live. They can survive gunshot wounds of the brain. Is it possible that that body would drop immediately? That's possible, yes. Okay. And what about um, if someone is just kind of bleeding out? It's just got internal organs, uh, soft tissue organs, um, and causes a bleeding out. Um, is that could that be a more of a longevity as far as how how long someone can function? What you're describing is like hemorrhage. Yes, internal bleeding, hemorrhage. Yeah. Okay. So people can die pretty rapidly from that. Um, it all just depends on whether uh, aid is rendered and the underlying health conditions that the person has. And there's many variables that affect. One person might die from hemorrhage pretty quickly, and another person might live long enough to have great uh, ender, uh, aid rendered and survive it. Well, I'm not talking about death as much as functioning upon receiving the injury. Okay, with internal bleeding, isn't it possible that a person can continue to walk for some time? Some people, yes. Okay. And if a person, it depends on how much they're bleeding, and you testified a little earlier about that. What did you testify about? You, you talked about it earlier. About what? About when someone is bleeding and how long they can last. It just it depends on the person and what they're bleeding from. So if a person 
um, can walk one mile per hour, for example, all right, something very slow, and then they are bleeding out at, at whatever rate, is it possible that they can go uh, yards before they fall? Yes. Okay. And so what with this type of injury, it's different than a spinal column injury or something that might take the person into a position of lights out. You know what I mean? In other words, they have a chance that they may still survive for some X period of time, depending, correct? They could still have movement um, versus if there was a spinal cord injury, they would be incapacitated pretty rapidly. Um, this is a aorta injury, um, which could be a rapid uh, incapacitation, but there's a potential that there may have been movement after as well. Okay, and that movement could have been feet, maybe even yards possibility, right? Yes. Okay. So just because this person falls down right there doesn't mean that's where they were shot with this type of injury, correct? Correct. And you said that that he lost, or you collected 50 milligrams of around the heart, correct? A blood? Milliliters. Milliliters, I'm sorry, thank you. And about how much is that in a cup or some other measurement that we can relate to it? I, probably a couple of these. Okay, can you hold that up for everyone to see? And you are have raised from your table um, little like Dixie cup type things that you that are there for you to have water. Right? So you're saying about two of those? Yeah, approximately. I don't know how many ounces you have. Okay. And this is around the heart. And then uh, you also testified that in the chest cavity, you also were able to collect 340 milliliters, correct? Correct. And give me how many cups of those would that be? Mm -hmm. uh, six times, seven times. Okay. Now, the clothing can act like a sponge that's around it. Uh, absorbing the blood from the location of a bullet hole, right? Yes. And the clothing in this case had some blood on it, right? I don't recall. Okay. And have you seen any photos of blood on the ground? I have not, no. Would it be surprising to you, based on knowing how this bleeding out um, is taking place, that there was very little blood on the ground? I mean, there could be blood on the ground. There could be small amount, a large amount, I, I don't know. And is it possible that the bleeding that you would think you would see could have been all maintained internally in this body? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that accounts for the large amount of blood that you're seeing in areas that are normally not with that type of amount of blood, right? Very good answer. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, that's it? Okay. Well. Now, do you remember, um, well, when you analyze the outer parts of the body upon the start of your examination, do you look for <laughs> things and objects that normally would not be normally found there? Yes. And did you notice in this case there was lots of debris? on or around the body. Uh, yes. Okay. Let me show you. Show you what's been marked as I think it's O O defense O O. Does this photo that I'm showing you on top of Paul A reflect the type of debris you found? I describe it as particulate debris. Um, so I see some particulate debris in photos. Yes. Okay. And let's skip one more. And does this photo reflect the amount of blood on the clothing? that was found and observed by you? I don't know. Okay, skip B, let's go to C, let's go to D. 
Again, at the medical examiner's office, is this photo taken? Oh, I've watched it. It's good shit watching those guys fight. Body bag in the background. There's so some yes. crazy stuff down south and of the border. And does that reflect, again, the particles that was observed with the body upon your examination? Yes. Okay, is there more photos in there? And then that, the next one, same thing, just different view? Yes. And that one. Ah. Yeah, guys, I mean, that's a neat thing. That rod just shows the trajectory. He could have been leaned over. He could have been laying. He could have been in any number of positions. Like, he could have been, like, up, like, leaning backwards. Who knows what he was doing and how it got to him. So... I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can get shot like that. Objection. showing you, I'll call it OOA, for a picture of the right hand. Were you aware that the right hand was under the body? Because it was also probably head, still head with, you know, the stiffness of that body, right? Did you observe the body being bent, the arm being bent? No. So you had no knowledge that this right arm was under the body upon um, observation of it? That's correct. Okay. But I'm going to show you from a photo from your location where the right arm, would you agree it is the right arm, right hand? This is a picture of the right hand, yes. Okay. And the debris that the, the hand is holding, correct? Uh, that's on the hand, yes. Okay. Which appears to be some kind of straw-like, long, grass-like material, correct? Uh, some of it, yes. What else is there? More granular. These the dirt. Okay. So let's point that out. So... It's right on the top, right there. All over. All over. Could this, thank you for drawing. Okay. Are you familiar that the terrain was in an environment like that? Did you have any knowledge of that? Um, yeah, I mean, most of our cases come from the desert. Okay. So this reflects that type of environment, correct? Correct. Now, there is all kinds of particles kind of stuck to this hand and there are things in his hand and that includes this straw-like grass material correct yes and the hand is somewhat closed or clenching in some form right that's how the photo was there's right? some flexion of the fingers in the picture yes okay when a person dies and as the body stiffens does it stiffen in the position it was last in typically yes in other words the hand doesn't move while you're dead right not unless someone moves it. Okay. And so this could reflect someone, I don't know, being dragged or grabbing onto the environment, correct? Could be. Um, I don't know how the body had been manipulated after it was found. I, I mean, there's many variables that affect that. But in my hypothetical, it's reasonable, correct? It's possible. If the body had laid there for enough time to pass so that rigor mortis had started, then yes. Okay. And but if someone's being dragged and grabs onto things and then passes, the the results of it could still remain in the hand, correct? Yes. It's, and I understand that's one hypothetical. Let me show you the next photo. So we'll call this B. Again, reflecting the same thing, the same right hand, correct? Yes. And the uh, environment kind of sticking to the paw or the top of the hand, correct? Yes. And a stick or something being clenched by the hand, correct? It's poking out of the interdigitary space, yes. Thank you. A little mm. different angle, but same shot. My last one, we'll call it C. Any idea? Um, I mean, is this more clenched or just a different angle? 
all the same. We're going to do a little bit different. You? Okay. Now, you mentioned that you get a... Council, it sounds like you're moving into a new area. It's a quarter to three. This is a good time to take a break. Okay, Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take our uh, mid-afternoon 30-minute break. Yeah. All right, chat. The chat she's holding on to the cut one, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, that his buddy cleared him out. I think that's a very realistic issue. So. Um. What, there's an earthquake? Oh, yeah. Who? Well, anyway. Uh, yes, this, I think, I I mean, I think they killed him and, or he got, something happened and they took his stuff. I mean, I don't think that's a hard sell for anybody. Hmm. Yeah. Do you remember? All right, guys, here we go. Yeah. And you can continue with your press presentation. Thank you, Your Do you remember we talked about something called stippling? Yes. Okay. Let's slow that down a little bit and go back over that. Um, what is it? Stippling is a pattern of injury seen on the skin that's caused by unburnt gunpowder impacting the skin uh, and leaving small punctate red purple abrasions so if i was suicidal and put my and if you look my way for one second and put a gun to my head you would suspect in that scenario that you would see stippling on my scalp somewhere here right no no i would not. be concerned if i saw stippling okay tell me what stippling is seen in intermediate range gunshot wounds not contact gunshot wounds. Okay. Would anything else be left there if it was contact, like I illustrated? Uh, typically, we would expect to see a muzzle stamp or a muzzle imprint. Okay, so you kept using the word intermediate range. Could you define that range again, please? Um, it's highly variable depending on the ammunition and the weapon. And the only way to know exactly distance from muzzle to target is to have the same ammunition and the same weapon and do repeated test firings. Okay. So when I'm giving numbers, it's general speaking, um, a couple of inches to typically a foot and a half. Um, sometimes you'll see a little bit further. So if I have a gun in my hand, which I'm using a pen, and I am standing back three feet and point a gun, at this person, is it possible that you might not see this evidence of stippling? Sorry, speak loud. Um, typically, you would not expect to see stippling at that range of muzzle to, to body. Because what? Uh, because gravity would pull the burnt and unburnt gunpowder off prior to it impacting the body. Okay. So you can't testify that someone wasn't standing in my proximity to the subject, this is the deceased here. Um, you can't testify if, if me having a, a very high caliber, let's say some sort of big handgun, uh, pointed at the person, like I'm robbing them, okay? It's possible that could have happened too, correct? Um, can you repeat or rephrase the question? Is there any evidence that would dispute that I'm standing here a couple few feet back from the subject, the deceased, having a handgun, pointing it at him, like as if I was robbing him? Is there anything that would dispute that happening based on your autopsy? Nope. He was clothed. Pardon? He was clothed, so I wouldn't expect to see stippling on a clothed body anyhow, because the clothing is going to absorb the burnt and unburned gunpowder. Okay, that was actually my next question. Thank you. Now let's go back to my question, but I, that was on my list. I'm going to creep up another small amount of space, okay? I'm holding a pen like it's a gun. I'm saying this for the court report. I know you can see what I'm doing. Or 
14. Is that better? Sure. Okay, thank you. And is there anything about your medical examiner report that would dispute the fact that I had a gun? As if I'm, and I'm using a, maybe I'm robbing the guy or whatever, um, that would contradict it. Assuming this is a pretty powerful handgun, is there anything that would dispute it that you see in your, in your report? That the distance of the gun from the body is within where you had it. Yes. Is that the question? Yes. No, there's, that's possible. Okay. One hundred percent, it'll be Oliver's clothing. So, as you moved on to my next question, and I'm going to make sure I understand you. Having clothing on, on you think you're thinking about clothing would be burned. Having clothing on you can um, obstruct any of the stippling from showing up on the body. Yes, it would show up on the clothing, not the body. Okay. It's not looking at the jury, and that's a little and weird. That's not something you would do, correct? That's correct. So you only do it with the actual body and so. stuff. All right, now I'm going to go back to, uh, well, actually, let me do this. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to enter into evidence uh, defense AAA, who has already been identified and shown to this witness, which is the full report of the med medical examiner's report. Uh, I would like to uh, note that it is a medical report. It does uh, identify itself through a um, affidavit that has been put on there. Um, long time ago. And the date of that report actually is the affidavit is July 19th, 23. And she went through all the pages already to look at it. I killed off a photo of the subject that I don't think is really part of the report that somehow got attached, so I took that off in all fairness. Your Honor, I, would, I had no objection if the entire report is the photo that she just took off. You want that on? Okay, no problem. No objection, Your Honor. Not objection. That's exhibit triple A. Thank you, Judge. Permission to publish a small portion of it. Investigator narrative. You did talk about earlier about getting information from law enforcement um, so that you could look at that information and then correlate with what you see in your examination, correct? Yes. And you said you did do it in this case, correct? Yes, probably. <laughs> okay. And uh, that has come in this report under the form of investigator narrative because you didn't author that, right? That's what you relied on to get you started, correct? Um, part, yeah, I don't know exactly what it says. Some of it could be prior to the examination. Sometimes the information comes in after. Okay, so you could fall back on it if you need to based on your evaluation, or you could use it to get started. Correct. Thank you. All right, I'm going to read it. It's very fine print. Put my flashlight on. This is January 30th, 23. An unidentified male was reportedly with a group of foreign nationals that were observed by a homeowner on his property. Yes, it's two of five, about 17 down. The homeowner indicated that the group was running parallel to the property and had long rifles on their possession. So pausing there for a second, hence, your reason to believe that this could have been a rifle could have came from the investigator, correct? Possibly, yes. Yeah. Okay. Because you would have read this in the beginning at least once, right? Uh, prior to signing a report, if it was, yeah, if it was offered on the 30th, yes. Thank you. He then allegedly pursued the group and engaged them, firing one shot from his AK-47 rifle. Now you've been identified a name, a type of rifle, right? Yes. But only one shot is noted. And you have one shot, right? Correct. But mm, you didn't hear about the eight, nine other shots in this case, did you? I'm not, I don't know the details. Okay, let's keep going. 911 was contacted at 1756 hours and the decedent was located by deputies with Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office at 1823. 
He was pronounced at 1824 hours by Deputy Lopez. The decedent was, and that's where you get your time, right? Correct. The decedent was noted to have a deep, a defect to his right um, posterior, posterior, I'm sorry, small print, aspect of the tor uh, torso, as well as the defect to approximately the center upper interior torso. No other defects were observed by the time the, the cause was reported, or the case was reported. Case, excuse me. Um, to PCOME. However, the decedent had not been manipulated much. Didn't say not at all, it says much, right? You, you hear what I said? Yes. Okay. And in, in true um, best scenario, you wouldn't want the body to be manipulated in any way, correct? Correct. In order to preserve the potential evidence, the location of the decedent was in a flat area of the property and was approximately 100 yards from the physical uh, residence. A Mexican voter identification card was located on the decedent with the name Gabriel Juan um, Barrera and date of birth of 926-74. Information was obtained via telephonic re interview with Deputy Barba from the Sheriff's Office. Uh, Deputy additional Barber. information was obtained Barber. via I don't know what PC OME preliminary death form completed by Deputy Barber. So you got all that information from Deputy Barber. Would that be fair to say it came through some sort of communication, teletype internet, some sort of form of technology? If that's what's documented, yes. Okay, and that's what I read, correct? Yes. And then you just add that to the report, this whole report, it, it, that information got added, right? But it's part of the case file. Okay. And it said that the subject shot one time at this deceased. And so you rely on that as being possibility of what's happening, correct? Yes. But you actually don't know, do you? She has to look at my notes for a second. And no, she doesn't. lab results which lab mm, blood work drugs toxicology toxicology I don't have that part of the report it was part of your document though how does she not have that what the like how does she not have that on her to know what happened That seems a little weird to me. Why does she not have it? I mean, I'm just saying. Chat over battle. Um, the toxicology screening positive findings included delta 9 THC uh, at the level of 2.0 nanograms per milliliter. Oh no, he did the lettuce. Blood sample that was submitted to NMS labs. What does that mean in English? What it was on the weeds. The it's a metabolite of marijuana. What does that mean, metabolite? A breakdown product. Which means he was so trafficking it. Of use of marijuana in his system? Correct. And is that a large amount, small amount, or can, does it matter? The recording limit is 1.0. It's, it's double that. Um, as far as amounts, I, I don't have an opinion as to numbers. It's not something I typically Here's use. another page. Is that, uh, there's nothing else further? Yeah, she's switching. That yes. Done? That's the only positive finding, correct? Which means he's probably trafficking if he had weed on him. Second to review my notes, Judge. <clears throat> Beach pictures of water receding off Okinawa. Uh oh. Yeah, that's weird they didn't tell her to bring her docs. Um. Yeah, so there's a massive. Uh, yeah, guys, a couple earthquakes all over the place um, off Taiwan. 
I know you guys were talking about it, but I'm just going to bring it up. Yeah, 7.4. Ooh, some stuff in Eastern Taiwan started collapsing. And Okay, now with a... Um... Oh, there's images of it. I can't see any. Um. So. Dr. Tim, are you familiar with marijuana and the breakdown? Tablet of marijuana? Um, not to the level of a forensic toxicologist. No. Is, is THC or Delta THC, is that the active ingredient or that's the breakdown of marijuana? I don't, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. All right. All right. All right. Oh, shit. I'm, damn. I just, oh, God. I just remember that. <sighs> Fuck. All right. So hold on, chat. Now remember. If that had been me or you, and we had been in a drunk, we had been in a fatal car accident, and we had killed someone, and we had, and we had this in our blood, that much THC in our blood, you know, he'd be running around screaming, he'd be running around screaming about how we just killed someone, and how that's enough to intoxicate somebody. I guarantee to you that's how we would handle that. So. Don't let him get away with that, chat. Don't let him get away with that. Don't let him get away. Japan's evacuating people. Oh, no. Um, so, oh, and guys, we found we're back where we need to be. So, let's see if we can get our speed back up. I'm just saying, I hate this when prosecutors do this kind of nonsense. They're like, well, it's just a little bit of weed, right? It's like every other time it's with this guy, I guarantee you, it's never just a little bit of weed. I guarantee you he prosecutes people for drugs. Oh, it's just a little bit of drugs. Except for now. In your findings, and talk about the toxicology report, in there, counsel read you the narrative about what, what was reported to have occurred on the, on the day of January 30th. Remember that? Yes. And in, that record, in that narrative, do you know who Barbara, Officer Barbara received the information from to fill that out? Do you know? I do not know. It could very well have come from the defendant, right? You don't know. I have. I, You're taking no it, yeah. That's correct. But you do have indication in the report about the use of, well, I want to make sure I read it right in the report, the use of a certain type of weapon that was used in this case, right? It's an AK 47. Do you remember that? Yes. Is the wound that you saw, the entry, the exit, and the damage inside the torso of the victim consistent with an AK-47? Yes. I'm going to go into the skeleton real quick. We have a lot of things with this demonstrative device here. One thing, let me just find it for it. I mean, you have cover exhibit 14. I will show you argument 14H. Do we call that photo? Yes. And we'll just remind the jury what that photo is again. It's the inside of the right chest cavity, uh, the area underlying the entrance wound, and it's showing the multiple rib fractures uh, with the sensitive hemorrhage and the large uh, defect in the chest wall. First, I'm going, to, I'm going to come over to the skeleton here, and we've got this upright, vertical, perpendicular to the ground skeleton, right? Yes. You remember when defense counsel was using a pen to show where a possible entry was was going to be conducted from a gunshot? Remember that? Yes. Right. And this is assuming a lot of variables, correct? Correct. Assuming the victim is upright, assuming someone is standing kind of right behind the skeleton here, right? Correct. And shooting at an upward angle with a handgun. Right. A lot of assumptions in this case, right? Yes. In this back pattern, right? Yes. Right. What I want to do, though, is talk about 
my seven, my six, seven, eight ribs, right? Correct. Do you mind coming down and doing this again for me? Looking at that photo, 14H. Using using my using 14H, remind the jury where that is on the body. So starting below the scapula, is that the scapula? That's the scapula. I know some anatomy. That's the scapula. So six, seven, and eight, right? Correct. Looking at that injury wound, or that, that that damage to the rib, explains the jury the the likely entry point or how that bullet comes into that body, the angle of that body. It's it's taking out this whole area. It's a large area of defect affecting or fracturing all three of these ribs. And what kind of angle are we talking about when it comes into that body? Is it the way your stick is showing now? I, I don't know exactly how the bullet is when it enters the body. I know how the bullet travels through the body. Okay, so then walk the jury through. First question is, if it hits a rib, can there be, we've heard the word yawing or deflection. Can there be a possible deflection from that bullet? Yes, um, ribs are hard materials. And so once it impacts a rib or three ribs, its trajectory is going to be altered in some way, shape, or form. It's not going to be continuing along that same trajectory as it had before it fractures those three ribs. So it's possible, doctor, that a shot from this angle to the victim can hit this rib cage at kind of a level line and deflect upward out through the chest plate. Yes. That's a possibility, right? It is. Right, you, can, you can give me the stick. Let me get that. Okay. Yeah, it's not in addition, doctor, to the skeleton, you got no information about what happened the day of January 30th, do you? No. You don't know how many shots were fired, what the victim, there's another victim in the case, what they testified to, you got no information. No. So hypothetically, I'm gonna give you a hypothetical, right? When most people hear a gunshot, what's the common reaction by most people when they hear a gunshot? To duck. To duck. I would object so to that So hypothetically, point. if someone hears three gunshots, Object. The reaction would be to get low. Don't let him do this. Low, right? And so it's not uncommon for. Get low, get low, skeet, skeet. Sure this be working. It's not uncommon for this person to be jumping <coughs> out of the way. Take cover, yes. Take cover. You How would they know where to take cover? The number of rounds fired or which round hit this person, do you? I do not know. So that's not an uncommon reaction when you hear three rounds fired then to duck or cover. Right? Objection, ask and answer. I'll right back, Chad. We also don't know the variable. We have a, a stationary skeleton in front of here, right? Yes. We don't know if this individual is moving or mobile, do we? No. That would change some of the variables in this case, right? Yes. Especially someone's walking, skipping, or even running, that would change trajectory and how that bullet enters the body. Objection, in. leading. Would any of those variables impact the bullet with the body? Yes. We talked about on cross examination about abrasions. Do you remember those questions? You saw some photographs? Yes. And you don't know, do you have any information from any other witness about what they observed the day of with this victim? Objection, you, leading. It's just a yes or no. You have, you have no information. That's leading. I do not know it. It's a yes or no. There's always objection. Please hold off on the answer until I end the rule. It's a leading question. <coughs> leading question is a question that suggests the answer. Do you have any information? Of what was testified about what happened to this victim on the day of January 30th? No. Did you see any photographs of the, the victim's pants? Not that I recall, no. You don't recall the victim's pants if they had holes in them? No, I don't recall. Showing a photograph in defense exhibit, I want to say it's triple A that's been admitted to the evidence. You see that photograph? I do. Do you see any do you see the pants, right? Yes. Based on the photograph, I can zoom in. Any holes or anything on these pants? Kind of grainy. So I got this. It's hard to see, but nothing obvious. The glaring. The jury's gonna have the photograph.
Just talk about the time, the pronouncement of death. You remember the questions on cross-examination about the pronouncement of death? Yes. The pronouncement of death is, I think you tested, explain again what the pronouncement of death is. It's, it's when someone is examined and determined to be dead. And that is when they, the time of death. It, it's, um, for the state of Arizona, that's the accepted, agreed upon time of death. Is that necessarily the time of the actual victim's death? No, rarely. Only in a hospital situation that the death is witnessed. Is it going to be the exact time of death? And you examined the body in this case, right? I did. On February 1st? Yes. And if the time of death is 6.30 on January 30th, if, if the victim was killed four hours earlier, would your analysis of the body be consistent with a four-hour earlier death? Objection, speculation. She said she couldn't tell because of the length of time and the refrigeration that she didn't have. That type of testing. We talked about the cooling, putting bodies in coolers and, and, and things like that, right? Correct. We talked about the decompensation and, and rigor mortis and the, the time setting of that, right? Yes. Right. And I know you're not CSI here. We're not watching a 30 minute show here. So the answer Objection is to sidebar. Yeah. What's that? Objection to sidebar. I'm sorry. I, 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 no, it's, it's my objection. The objection. Question to sidebar. No, it's to me, Your Honor, my narration. It's my narration. I strike that. So let me, let me go to the question about decompensation and rigor and so forth, right? When does, when someone's shot and killed and, pronounce, and, and say they die, not the pronouncement, they die, what's the timeline for the jury about what's going on with the human body? So the three things that we talked about is all the virus, the cooling of the body uh, after death. That's going to happen right away, um, instantly, um, until the body reaches ambient temperature meaning room temperature or the temperature of the air around it. Um, so typically the body is warm to touch. Most people are warm. Um, and then over a period of time, it's going to get cool. Well, that's dependent on the environment that the body is in, um, underlying uh, reason for the death. Those those sorts of things all impact the elgar mortis. Uh, liver mortis is the pooling of the blood. Again, that happens. Typically, you can see it on the skin surface within 30 minutes to a couple of hours. It's going to be evident. At about 12 hours, it becomes what I call fixed, right? Where you push it and no longer goes away. Prior to that, you're going to push it, it's going to blanch. So about 12 hours, it becomes fixed and it stays fixed. It doesn't ever change. So if I push on a body and on the live room or this lividity on the body and it's fixed, I know that person has been dead at least 12 hours, give or take, right? All those other things play a role, but that's generally speaking what, what we see. And the last of those is right or mortis. That's the stiffening of the muscles after death. Um, Usually that's going to set in within an hour or two. After someone dies, you're going to start to notice in the smaller muscles first, they're going to become stiff. So you're going to see it in the jaw, feel it in the jaw and the fingers first, um, and then it moves into the larger muscle groups. And it becomes firmer over a period of time, up until that 10 to 12 hour mark again, when it reaches maximal strength, right? So at 12 hours, the jaw is going to be really firmly closed in that it will take a lot of force to open it. It's going to take a lot of force to break the muscle rigidity in the arms and legs. Um, but that does pass over time. So it reaches its maximal about uh, 12 hours, and then it starts to dissipate. And eventually, as the other decomposition processes start, then it goes away altogether, and the body becomes very flaccid. But you have also um, green discoloration of the body, bloating, skin slip. All those things are going to be starting as well as um, when the, the, the regular mortis is passing, this stuff starts to happen. So, so you, you, you pretty much have a pretty solid understanding of what happens to a body after death. Is that fair to say? Yes. So if someone were to someone come across a, a dead body, a body has been shot or whatever it is, and hypothetically touch the body, no pulse, but the body is still warm, can you determine within a period of time if the body is still warm when the death happened? Within a couple of hours, probably. If it hasn't, if, if it's in the, I mean, it depends on the environment that it's in again. Sure, just a second, Ron. So no questions I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Any questions for this witness for the appeal of the jurors? All right. Ron, you're saying you had a terrible day at work. Well, hope it gets better. Um, hope you weren't finding more uh, dildos. Or hopefully that was an old job. But either way, yeah, welcome. Welcome and join us. This whole jury question thing is wild to you. I I love the concept. Not every court does that, and I wish, I wish more courts allowed it. It gives you an idea of what the jury's thinking. It gives you an idea of what you need to shape. I mean, 
why don't they get the right to question stuff? I think they should always have that right to know what the hell's going on. Um, they're the finder of fact. They should... They're the finder of fact. Why don't they get to find facts? Is internal pooling of blood consistent with the body being prone or supine during the time of death? So the blood that was uh, pooled within the body cavities, the two cavities that there was blood was the sacrum of the heart and in the right chest I'm cavity. Figured, I'm just saying. There was like, blood in there because of, of the gunshot wound injuries. Fucking um, any triphosphate or adenosine triphosphate. When Why do you hate that? Our office Alpha Fox. And at the time of examination is going to always be in a supine position until we move it in a different and I'm just going to say, you probably didn't realize I knew what adenosine triphosphate was. It's the energy of people. It's what makes us move. Position. Um, and so it, it shifts with the positioning. But for the most part, um, once uh, we take custody of the body, it's going to be in a supine position. So it's going to be pulled at the back of, of those um, surfaces just because of gravity. So this, Gravity! The question was directed to whether or not you state an opinion uh, based on experience, knowledge, and training about whether pulling the blood has any um, reflection on whether the body was prone or supine during the time of death. The steward is trying to, is trying to get more information about whether the body, whether it's evidence uh, that you can testify to as to whether the body was uh, supine or prone during the time of death. I don't know. Time of death. I do not know. Right, another question, is, uh, is the internal wound consistent with the bullet tumbling inside the body? I mean, yes, the bullet, like, is going to yaw and cavitate. It's, it doesn't just zip right through. The fluid in a human being and the, the guts and all that, it's water-based. You're going to have, like, hydrostatic tension on that bullet. It might hit a rib. I mean, every it, the littlest thing could deflect a thing going fucking 2,000 miles an hour. I mean, that's not, that's not hard to do. I don't know how the fuck she's going to be able to answer that question. Um... Personally, I don't think this jury knows what the fuck they're doing. I don't know. I just know the path that it took. Another question. Is, are there any definitive findings with internal organs that show that blood has not moved since cell death in the organs? Parentheses. I'm trying to determine if body organs show the body was prone or supine uh, at the time of cell death or during cell death. <clears throat> this particular question is directed towards... The organs. The organs. So, is there any definitive findings with internal organs that show that blood has not moved since cell death in the organs? The after the heart stops beating, the blood is not moving anywhere um, other than when we reposition the body, um, which again is in that prone position. So, the blood is going to be pooled in the organs on the same way that it pools um, on the skin surface as well. A couple more questions. Um, in your opinion, you know, and all of these questions is. You know, obviously, if you know or if you have a good basis to know and the foundation, if you don't know, that's not a fine answer. But the question is, in your opinion, is the path of the entry wound consistent with a shot being with a shot from long or short range? Um, I, I don't know. It's not a contact wound. Another question, in your opinion, is the entry wound consistent with a straight shot or at an angle? Uh, the bullet takes an upward angle uh, in the body. The trajectory of the bullet in the body is uh, right to left, back to front, and upward. Within the body. And that's within the body. Correct. I do not know outside of that. All right, very well. There's some questions. I'll hand the questions to the clerk. And the lawyers can ask follow up questions to the questions of the jurors. Mr. Jim. Real briefly, Dr. Jim, on the movement on the body, um, you've handled countless autopsies, correct? Correct. You handled from the body was found at scene and then it's transported to coroner's office, right? Yes. That body has to be picked up, put in a body bag, and shipped, right? Yes. A lot of movement goes on, right? Yes. No more questions, right? That's the initial questions. In relationship to that same question, I guess if I understood your answer, due to the movement of the body, the blood is moving due, due to gravity in the position that it's placed in, correct? Yes. So it's hard to say how it was closer at time of death. Correct. Okay, nothing further. Any more questions or follow up questions from any of the jurors witness? Let's see not. Is the witness excused? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, um, the state can call its next witness. Yes. And while they're doing that, so you've heard um, objections that I've been ruling upon, one of the frequent objections, more frequent than others, anyway. 
has been leading. So uh, let me explain what that is. A leading question is a question that suggests the answer as opposed to being open-ended. So cookies missing from the cookie jar, mom says to Billy, Billy, isn't it true that your brother Bob stole the cookies from the cookie jar? The answer, the question suggests the answer that is Bob. A non-leading question would be, Billy, do you know who stole the cookies from the cookie jar? Open-ended. And if he says yes, then a non-leading follow-up question would be, who stole the cookies from the cookie jar, as opposed to, it was Bob right. Now, non-leading questions, when a, witness, when a party calls a witness, they're not allowed to ask leading questions. It's their witness. They can ask open-ended questions. Either party. Cross-examination, a lawyer can ask leading questions. So that's where this objection comes. Again, it's not a reflection on anyone's question here, any of the lawyers. It's just been a frequent objection. So All right, chat, we're going to let this run, but I am not sitting here listening to this for a minute because this is not very... Thank you for your patience. God, he sounds like me explaining shit. Not very good. I like my new hat. Well, thank you. Thank you, J-Rock. Do you follow this story that the testimony you're about to give in the matter before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. If you would please come over and take a seat, please. Could you just briefly introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Tara Hussle. Do you mind if I call you Tara? Absolutely. All right, Tara, where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. You flew in this morning, right? I did, yes. Long flight? A little bit. Excuse me, I don't think your microphone's on. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Right. And Tara, can you spell your name for the court reporter? Your last name, too. Yes, uh, first name, T-A-R-A-H. Last name, H-E-L-S-E-L. -E -E your? What do you do for a living, Tara? I am a forensic scientist and the manager of the forensics department at a company called RJ Lee Group. What does RJ Lee Group do? So RJ Lee Group is a materials characterization laboratory, and it has a lot of different departments that offers a pretty wide range of scientific testing services. For example, we have a chemistry department that does things like water testing. We have a group that analyzes concrete, and we have many other departments. However, we also have a small criminal forensics department, which is the group that I'm a part of. What does that small forensic group do? We specialize in gunshot residue analysis. And what's gunshot residue analysis? So uh, gunshot residue analysis is basically looking for particles that result from the discharge of a firearm, uh, specifically particles that originate from the primer, which is one of the parts of the cartridge. If, if I just use GSR for short, that's gunshot residue. Would that be an OK abbreviation? Yes, absolutely. OK. So GSR, how many cases have you worked on doing a GSR analysis? I have done analysis in over 700 cases, analyzing over 4,000 samples. And how long have how long you been doing that? Uh, a little over seven years now. And what was, your, what was your background before that? I had a Bachelor of Science degree in Forensic Science from Waynesburg University. And then following graduating, I started at RJ Lee Group. No one knows where Wayne's, Wayne's College is at. We just know where U of A is at. So where is Wayne's College at? Uh, Waynesburg University is in southwestern Pennsylvania. It's kind of close to the West Virginia border. Sorry, Waynesburg. So Waynesburg, yes. yes. Were you asked to do so? You don't work for Santa Cruz County, do you? I don't, no. And in your practice with RG, RJ Lee, do you often get hired by jurisdictions to do GSR analysis? Yes, absolutely. Our laboratory does gunshot residue analysis for agencies uh, all throughout the United States and also beyond. And were you asked to do anything work in, in this investigation? Yes, I was. What were you asked to do, Tara? I was asked to analyze um, a gunshot residue collection kit uh, for gunshot residue analysis. All right, I'm going to show you um, a little bit. Actually, I think I can have you do it, Tara. Do we have some scissors over this? All right, I'm going to have you do it. You mind? That'll work? Sure. Okay. I'm showing you up there as you get set up to do it is State Exhibit 130. Cut away. You just slip up. And for the record, the witness is opening government exhibit 130. Do you recognize the tape on that, Tara? I do, yes. Is that your tape? Uh, yes, this is the evidence tape that I put over the box um, upon completing the analysis. 
And how do you know it's your evidence tape? Um, so over top of where the tape meets the box um, are my initials and on the date in which I sealed it. Okay. And can you look inside there? Yes. What's inside there? Uh, so inside of there is... Um, you don't have to pull it. Just, just tell us what's inside there. Uh, is this um, basically this bubble wrap bundle. And what, do you know what's in the bubble wrap bundle? Uh, within there would be the gunshot residue kit that I analyzed. Your Honor, we'll move to admit Government Exhibit 130 as evidence. Sorry. Can I get clarity? Is it to the box or to the contents? Okay. Obviously, the contents of the box. You, you want to open it? Yeah, approach the box and look inside. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Just keep it low, though. Keep it low. No objection, Sean. So that 130 is a bit. All right, Tara, can you just take stuff out of it? And, and it's, So uh, this bag was inside of the bubble wrap. Did you recognize that bag? Yes. Is that your bag? Um, this bag was not ours. This bag was um, originally set with the evidence. Oh, okay. So can you open that bag? Yes. And inside that bag, what do we have? This is the gunshot residue collection kit that I received in this case. And what goes in it, the, the, the kit? Um, so this kit is composed of a number of stub samples. They're basically small vials that have an adhesive sampler inside that would, in theory, be dabbed onto an area of interest and attempt to pick up any particles that might be present. Okay, and um, how many, is there, how many samplings are in there? Uh, there should be five. Well, you want to Should I open it? Yes, yes there are five. Are they marked in any way? Yes, they are uh, marked with the numbers that were written on them when I received them, which is one through five. And then whenever I receive them, I also put on an RJ Lee Group sample label for each one. Uh, and those labels are also present. This is one of those um, situations, just for the court's record, is foundation to be laid later on the samplings. Those samplings come from, does it, does it indicate where they, the samplings come from? Um, on the labels I put on, yes. So uh, sample number one is labeled as jacket one. Sample number two is labeled as jacket uh, parentheses two. Sample number three is from pants. Sample number four is from shirt. And then sample number five is a collection blank. And what's a collection blank? Blank. Blank. B-L-A-N-K. Yes. What's a collection blank? So a collection blank is basically done to ensure that contamination is not occurring during collection. Uh, generally speaking, maybe may be left open to the environment during collection to show that there were not particles in that environment. Um, however, since I didn't collect the sample, I can't say for certain how it was used in this case. Okay, but you received those from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department? Yes. Do you remember the officer? Is it indicating where you report? Who said those to you? Um, I cannot uh, recall the name offhand. Would your report help you refresh your recollection? Yes. Your permission to approve. Government Exhibit 40. I should have Government Exhibit 40.1. Yeah. Did that refresh your recollection? Yes. Who, who sent those to you? Uh, Detective Mario Barba. Did you say what agency? The Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. And just so I have it written down, one and two samples come from the jacket, number three, the pants. Yes. Four, a shirt. Yes. And five is a blank. Correct. Kind of like a, like a control group, like a control? Yes, that would be another term for a control. Okay, and we did... You did a GSR analysis on those four, or did you do it on the blank one too? Yes, on all of the samples, including the blank. So you do a GSR analysis on all five of those samples? Yes. What's your results on that? They were all negative for gunshot residue. And what does that mean, in your opinion? Um, basically, it just means that gunshot residue wasn't present on the samples. Um, I can't say why there were not particles there, but just simply that there were no particles there. One of the reasons, so I just could be completely forthright, one of the reasons is the sampling had blood on it, right? The sh one of the shirts had blood on it? So I didn't receive the actual garments. I received the samples that were collected. Okay. And what does blood do? So blood can mask gunshot residue. So if there is blood on a surface, um, it could cover up particles that may be present so that you wouldn't be able to see those particles. But those five files, those samples, showed the jacket, two of them were the jacket, pants, shirt, and sample, no GSR. Correct. Just moment here, Thank you. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What is the distance that gunshot residue might show up? Um, so that really varies. Uh, typically, the cloud of particulate that is expelled during a discharge. I know where she's going to go with this. Um, if he's 200 yards away, it wouldn't be there. But let's say it's close. If he's close, he laid outside for how many days? And the wind and all that would take it all away. Can travel several feet, usually within about four to six feet. However, environmental conditions can also make that travel further. And then in addition to that, there are some particles not from that cloud, but actually on the bullet that can travel farther distances. If I have gunshot residue on my left sleeve here as I'm pointing to my left arm and I brush hard enough and everything, could I affect whether there will be any signs of it? Yes, gunshot residue can be easily removed. So uh, things like environmental factors or activity can cause particles to be removed from a surface. And if I take my right arm that still has particles and rub it against my co-counsel like I'm doing here in Illustrating, is it possible that the gunshot residue would show up on her jacket? Yes. So just like I'm shocked as it is easily removed, it's also easily transferable from surface to surface. What is the reasonable time that you would, based on your knowledge, that one should do this testing? Uh, it really depends. So um, it depends on the circumstances. So. Uh, studies have shown that with normal activity, gunshot residue on the hands will be removed within about five hours or so. Um, with clothing, it really depends. Um, if there are particles on a garment and that garment remains undisturbed, the particles will remain indefinitely because they don't break down or degrade. However, if it, that garment is subject to much activity, coming into contact with things, handling, all of those could be factors that could remove particles. If the clothing tested was put in a bag for storage together, rubbing upon each other, could that affect the result? It could cause particles to move from garment to garment if they are all back together. If I brushed off my right arm onto my co-counsel, could it remove it from my right arm and now only be on her jacket? Yes, um, it would depend on how many particles are there and the extent of activity, but yes, that could be possible. The gunshot residue needs to have exposure to an item in order for it to possibly show up on it, correct? Uh, yes, so if gunshot residue is on something, it's from either being near the discharge of a firearm or from coming into contact with something with gunshot residue on it. Now you tested, uh, what was the date of your testing? Um, so the testing was done in July of 2023. So the report was July 25th, so it would have been uh, probably within the days leading up to that. So you said July or June, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, July. Thank you. So this is close to six months after the date of the offense, which has been noted here as January 30th. Did you know that? I did not. Okay. Optimist, I mean, let me strike that. More reasonably would be um, if you're going to test, you should have tested closer to the date of the offense would be a better choice, correct? Uh, once the samples are collected, no, because the particles don't break down or degrade. They're not going to go anywhere. So as soon as those items are contained, whether it's the samples or the articles, whether they're tested immediately or months later, that's not going to change. What um, date was the collection made? Uh, I'm not sure what the data collection was. Do you have anything in your report that says it? Not the data collection because we did not perform the collection. So you don't know if it was collected in June? I don't. May? I don't. So if it hadn't been collected early, that could affect the lack of results, correct? Not from the garment because if the garments themselves are contained, again, those particles aren't going to go anywhere. So for example, we've tested garments that have been in storage for a decade and have found gunshot residue particles on them. If these clothing items that you tested was placed in a plastic bag and moved around, could those particles, if they're there, show up on the plastic bag rather than the clothing? Depending on the extent of activity and how much particles are, how many particles are there, yes, that would be possible. Now, we have seen what appears to be a gunshot close to the back, a little bit to the side. That's the entrance wound, okay? Okay. All right, and you don't know that, right? No. Okay. I want to show you something. It's marked, but I'm not going to be, just want to discuss this so you can see it first, okay? Okay. All right. Okay, just for the record, it is marked as defense HH. I just want you to look at it and then I'll ask you a question in a minute, okay? Okay. I mean, when you have a chance to examine it. Now, according to an item, very easily destroyed. It's not admitted yet. It's a photo in this case of a backpack. 
correct? Correct. And would you say that's a pretty good size backpack? Um, I would say so, yes. Kind of plump, looks kind of fat, typical height of a backpack, right? Yes. And backpacks are usually worn on your back, right? I would presume so, yes. So if I have this size of a backpack covering my back, wouldn't it be smart to test the backpack for gunshot residue rather than clothing underneath the backpack? It could be helpful. Um, it would depend, again, on the circumstances. Well, let's make this more clear. If this backpack was on a subject, okay, that is now deceased, following me? Yes. Okay. And it's kind of wide, and it's about yay high, I'm reflecting, I don't know, three feet tall or whatever. If it's covering up the clothing, like the jacket or the shirt, isn't it possible, well, isn't it true that gunshot residue cannot penetrate through this backpack to land on the items below it? Correct. If there were particles um, basically dispersing that area, um, and that backpack is the outermost garment, but that could block the particles from getting to lower layers. And you were never given a backpack, were you? I was not. You received a jacket, correct? Uh, I didn't receive the jacket. I received samples that were labeled as coming from the jacket. How big are those samples? Uh, they are small vials. They are the vials um, in front of me. Can you hold one up again? Yes. They're these small vials. Does it tell you on those vials where it came from? So um, the that information was provided to me from Detective Barba. So the samples were labeled one through five. Um, he clarified to me which of each sample came from. So he clarified that one and two were from the jacket, three was from pants, four was from a shirt, and the fifth was a collection blank. You don't know where on the item? No. So far as you know, they're underneath the backpack. Yeah, I can't speak to the circumstances around the items or the collection as I only received samples that were already collected. And whatever customers that come and need your assistance in your lab, they don't tell you when they collected it? Um, not always, no. Would be helpful, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. That's not going to change whether or not gunshot residue is present on the surface. So this is not necessarily scientific in, or conclusive, it's just more of a helpful to, tool. It is scientific in that it's based on a scientific analysis, but basically this analysis can just tell you whether or not particles are present. It can never say why there are or are not particles or um, what scenarios could have caused this result. Pass away. That was not good for the state. That looks really Karen, bad. You saw the, the image that defense counsel showed you of the backpack? Yes. Yeah, and that looked like a school backpack? Uh, it just looked like a standard backpack. And do you know the collection procedures that Detective Barbo used? I don't. Or the determination of which samples to send to you? No. That's for Detective Barbo, right? Correct. Your job was to look at those five vials and see if there's any gunshot residue, right? Correct. You know what bullet wipe is? Um, I'm familiar with it, yes. What is bullet wipe? Basically, um, it is from basically the passage of a bullet through a garment. Do you know if there was any bullet wipe found in this case? I don't know. That's another question I have your eyes. Thank you. Any questions for the witness from the jurors? Very well. Uh, juror number 10, I read this one word uh, as experimenting. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, just one sure. All right, question from uh, one of the jurors. Is your determination done by ex empirical, experimenting, or with literature? So uh, the basis of the analysis, um, there's plenty of literature um, around the history of this type of analysis. Basically, we use an instrument called the scanning electron microscope um, to analyze these samples and looking for the presence of combinations of lead, barium, and antimony, um, which are specific to the discharge of a firearm. Um, but all of that is based on um, really decades of literature and research in the industry. Follow-up questions uh, from the uh, question of the juror. Sure. Um, Tara, is that, is that because they're generally accepted scientific procedures and methods? Yes. Any follow-up questions from the defense? No, sir. May this witness be excused. Yes, Sean. Yes, Sean. Thank you very much. It's not an excuse. Uh, let's talk to counsel. Remember the admonition of the court? We will uh, 
Again, again, tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m., please be in the jury room at 8.30 punctually. Thank you very much. We rise to court. All right, Shadow. We just did eight hours on just under four hours. So, um, who's got diabetes legs? What? The fuck are you guys talking about here? Oh, are you talking about her? Well, so that's it, guys. Um, Clyde, Clyde, Clyde is having a bad night because of the thunderstorm that rolled through. He is hanging out with 2.0 right now, and he is out, he is high as fuck because she gave him a bunch of uh CBD treats. So, so yeah, guys, that's uh, this was, I don't think this is a good day for the state overall. I honestly don't think so. I, I was not in. I mean, surprisingly, they've got to be. Are we? Are we? Are we really live tomorrow? No, I've got. Well, actually, I mean, because here's the deal. I've got a thing at. Wait, what time do I have to be out the office? I got to be. Can I get an arraignment? Um. Let me see here. Depending on if I can. Um. Hmm. I might be able to chat. Huh. Right now, 50-50 shot. We'll do this live. Um, hmm. Don't know yet. I'll let you guys know in the morning, okay? Um, other than that, we're caught up. Does anybody, is anybody really convinced that this happened yet? Or is anybody really convinced George Kelly shot this guy? Like, convince me on a reasonable doubt at this point. Because notice, that's the... And I was worried, because they talked about Kelly making statements. That's all he said. They never brought him in for an interview or something. So, like, God almighty. Or watch a live on Crime Talk. I mean, I guess. But then you're not watching it here. Um, oh, wherever you guys watch is fine. Scott is great on Crime Talk. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not convinced. This has not been impressive. Um, I mean, I was worried. That, I was worried that Kelly was going to have this big interview. They didn't interview the guy, which it sounds like he may have been smart enough to shut his fucking mouth. Um, but we don't know. We don't know. Uh, he's innocent. Should be hired to secure the border. Yes. These are great defense attorneys. They're working with the they're working with the bad case the state's got. The foamer hat is killing you. Well, J Rock got me a hat, so I'm wearing the hat. You can say, you know, can't buy me twenty more hats because then I can't wear them all. Um. Yeah, I'm voting not guilty. I am voting not guilty. I'm still not guilty. So. Yeah, just want to get back through here. Um, Juror 13 saying, I wouldn't doubt they run the numerous illegals through a, an abbreviated exam. Oh, yeah, because most of them are going to be dead from exposure out in the desert. I totally, I totally, yeah. And like, I see why this doctor only works on dead patients. Oof, yes. Um... Juror 13, I'll sit earlier. I hope it's the original backdraft I was watching. That's my brother, goddammit! And, yep. That's the only one with watching with Axe and Bull. Not that kind of Bull, guys. They're, the guy's name was Bull. I'm not gonna... Well, I could go with my striped shirt. Um, did the defense get anywhere with the medical examiner's testimony? Uh, they just show you don't actually know what the guy was doing when he... Got shot. You know anything. So it, it doesn't it didn't help them at all. Because it's a shot that went like through like this. 
So it either came down this way or it came up and through. And it came up and out the chest. It's like, it doesn't... Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, the, the stick and the skeleton indicates it's closer range. And I think so, too. I think he probably got shot by his buddies. Because, yeah, they talk about him getting dragged. They had the strap marks. And he had his radio still. Like, the guy had a radio. You know, it's like he's running around with his bow fang trying to get on the ham frequencies. Like, hola! Hola, sad hammerinos! <laughs> um... You guys probably hunched down a seeking position, yeah. Yep, could be, could be. So, all right, guys, that's it for tonight. We're all caught up. Day six is done. Uh, let's see here. You guys are talking about what happened. In... Hold on. We'll look at this uh, tsunami stuff real quick. A tsunami, hot ho ro ro, hurrah! So, guys, the safe house is back up. Um, oh, Hunter Biden just got his motions to demit, dismiss uh, for his tax case tossed. Um, you guys said you put something up. Where is it? I don't see it. Billy, you said you put something up in locals. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't see it if it's there. And I just refreshed. So if it's there, I don't see it. Apparently there's a big earthquake out in, like, Taiwan. Let me see if I can find on Google or Twatter. Let's see what the... Let's see what the Twizatter says. Um, yeah, earthquake rocking uh, Taiwan. Um... Uh, let's see here. T S U N A M I. Tsunami. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, Okinawa. Ooh, they they got the tsunami sirens running. Here we go. Someone fired up harp. Got to be careful, man. Everybody's off the beaches. Everybody's fleeing. Oh boy. Papa, don't be too high. You stay high. There are people in there. Oh wow. You're a bitch. That's a bitch. Oh, that's Taipei. Well, that's not good. At least nothing fell over. <laughs> well, there's the ocean kind of going out a little bit. There's no good pictures of the ocean going out, though. I kind of wanted to see. That's not a super huge withdrawal. Like, I'm talking about where the water... I'm going to see the water, the water's like... Like, all the way gone. That's not that far. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, that'd be scary. They're not on a bridge right now. I wonder if Jeff felt it. It probably did. Oh, 
Um, oh, there's that one we've already seen. It doesn't, I, I don't, it doesn't look like the oceans are treating, so it's not like that scary. Um, oh, here you go. Fuck. Ah, that's kind of interesting. Most people in the woods were caught. Um, <laughs> they have made Chim and Mao very angry. There's a landslide. The thing is, Taiwan is a very mountainous country, so that's not abnormal for like rock slides to happen. Oh, there's a pupper. The pupper's going to find out about the earthquake. Here we go, guys. Wholesome pupper trying to alert everybody. Wholesome pupper. Wholesome as pupper. Um. Oh. Oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Somebody got squished, I bet. Bam, that went right through someone's apartment. Ooh. Oof, oof, oof. So, yeah, uh, stay frosty in Japan or Okinawa or if you're in southern Ohio and uh, Kentucky, eastern Kentucky and parts of Tennessee, it's getting really bad out there, too. So just uh, be careful. Bunch of storm stuff. Um, let me see. Um, oh no, Ryan Hall stopped, so I guess it's all kind of over with. So, not really a whole lot of storm chasing right now. So. So. We're all done. Yeah, the CCP did it. No naps on the beach, yes. So. Um. All right, guys, that's it. So I will see you tomorrow. Um, I'll know first thing in the morning if I could do it. I will put out a notice on Locals, and I will put up the stream right away. If you guys don't see it first thing in the morning, you know, they're, they're not starting. I think, wait, what time do they start tomorrow? Hold on. What time do they say they're starting? They said they're starting 1030 tomorrow, I think. Let me double check here. Let me just double check what time they said they're starting back up at. Because remember, part of it is they're doing a jury view tomorrow. Oh. 
Eight thirty. Okay. So eight thirty to eight thirty their time, ten thirty Eastern time, guys. Ten thirty Eastern. I'll know by probably nine o'clock Eastern if we can do it. If we can stream it, we'll stream it, guys. All right. So that'll be the game plan. Yeah, eight thirty, eight four, but eight thirty is the time I'm I'm taking care of. So. Um. So that'll be the game plan. So guys, good night, everybody. And uh, you know, remember, just because you did it doesn't mean you're guilty. Um. Oh, I forgot to mention we got a. We would have already played the music off fifteen times already. So. Yes, eleven thirty Eastern. No, eight thirty. Mo Arizona's Mountain Time, not e Pacific. Arizona's Mountain Standard, guys. So. Actually. Oh, Arizona doesn't have daylight savings time? Okay, so. 11.30, we'll know. I'll put it up, guys. Don't worry. Um, yeah, we'll figure out something tonight, okay, guys? So take care, and uh, see you guys tomorrow, one way or another. Take care, everybody.